right after the Noachian, and that's when Valens Marineros was likely formed. Chrysi Planitia, which you can see right in the center there. Chaisei Valens up at the top left. Um, if anyone is uh, familiar with this area, uh, so one of these valleys right in the center here, not Valens Marineros, but like a little up, uh, like maybe 10 degrees north, that's where the Mars Pathfinder rover landed. This one? Uh, oh, that one uh, up here. Uh, north, north, uh, yeah, north, like 10 degrees uh, at the center. Uh, I don't know how to describe uh, it. I don't uh, know. Round here, Canyon Land. Yeah, like uh, west, yeah, west 35, north 10, something like that. Yeah, yeah, around right there. here. Um, we can actually probably, it would be a good time to turn this on. Oh, yeah, go for it. I think it's that, uh, it's called Eris Phallus, and I think it's that thing on the right that you see, that long. Video. There we go, Eris Phallus. Uh, so I think this is where the Pathfinder rover landed. But this is sort of Hesperian era terrain where there was large single flood events, um, possibly even glacier related, uh, which is which is why I really like it because I love glaciers. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is where Yajera. Another thing that I should probably mention is that. Um, so how how do English? So is it uh, Jezero? I'd say Jezero. That's how I've heard it pronounced. See, that kind of like hurts my brain a little bit um, because uh, that word looks very similar to Jezoro in Polish. And Jezoro means lake. Um, oh, it turns that's out weird. that's that actually has the same etymology. Um, really? Because huh. uh, Jezero, uh, it was named after a town in Bosnia. And the town in Bosnia was named Lake in Bosnia, um, which is fitting because it's a lake. Um, but yeah, a Hesperian era terrain uh, is sort of what we get uh, in Jezero Crater. Um, so there was clearly a few large scale flooding events. You can tell by how spread out the alluvial fan is that it clearly didn't have like major channels already to move into. It sort of spread out and created this very wide fan, uh, which interests geologists. Um, yeah, so for people who are just joining, we're just going over the geology of Mars and the geology of uh, Yezero Crater, or Je Jezero Crater. Um, and then just very briefly before I like bore everyone to death with geology, um, the last era is the Amazonis or Amazonis era. Um, and basically that's that's the newest terrain. Um, so if you go to Amazonis Planitia or in the middle of Asidus Planitia, Utopia Planitia, if you go to the Northern Lowlands, it's this okay. very new terrain where you see basically no cratering. Oh yeah, you can see that very clearly there. There's like a few, a few splats, but nothing much. Exactly, um, and it's also very interesting because uh, probably around half of scientists believe that that the area that your mouse is over right now was once a huge ocean, and yet there is essentially zero hydrated minerals there, which is it seems like a paradox, but huh. it's. It's actually not because the only place we really see uh, uh, hydrated minerals is when there's some, some kind of unconformity, when we have like a cliff face or some or a crater where it punches through the crust and uh, unveils a bunch of old rocks. Uh, so we do see some hydrated minerals, but it's in those giant craters that you see there. And virtually everywhere else, there's none of that. Okay. So either... That's that sort of leftover Hesperian material that was flooded there, or there's been deposition over the top, and it's been hidden up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and okay. and Jezero Crater is very interesting too because, as you can see, Mars is sort of split. Uh, there's the Northern Lowlands and the Southern Highlands, and there's really just a line. Yeah, that goes it's very clear this. on this. Exactly. You can see it, it looks like a tennis ball, the way it sort of the line loops around the top. Oops, yeah, and, and, now, and then back geologists now. call that the, the Martian dichotomy. And uh, Jezero, I, I keep I keep pronouncing it. I don't know how, how you're supposed to pronounce it. It's right along the dichotomy. Um, so there's a lot, there's a confluence of many different uh, terrains and minerals. Um, yeah, it's, it's the place you want to be. And that, that's where Gale Crater is too, where Curiosity landed. It's at another spot, like 5,000 kilometers away. On the dichotomy. 
Okay. So, uh, Henry, um, just uh, I'm going to route you uh, some uh, questions. Um, and one of them uh, is a nice one to start off. What happens to the landing craft after it drops uh, Perseverance? Because it will hover a bit and then uh, we've seen it fly off. But uh, what happens uh, after that? Will it just crash or? So should we should we go through the whole EDL? Should we? I think let's save that a bit. I mean, let's save that until maybe a little bit before it starts because that will be twenty minutes of time we can just block out. Um, but the the answer is that it just flies away and destroys itself. Um, I don't know if there's been thoughts about putting instruments on it as a separate lander, but it's very much designed. It's not got any solar panels. It's just batteries and engines basically. Um, so you could potentially, if you really wanted to build it into a little lander that lands by itself. I've done that in KSP. Um, but the merit that they've clearly decided is more valuable to put that same mass on the rover um, versus on a separate vehicle. Yeah, I think the, in the Curiosity landing, uh, I think they got about 650 meters distance before it crashed. Yeah. So yeah, they... They use pyrotechnics to uh, cut the cord, and then they just they get as far away as they possibly can. Yeah. Well, if, if you think about the, um, just the dynamics of it, it, it's hovering with an extra ton of rover underneath. So even if you, if you just cut those ropes, then it's going to fly into the distance at very, very high speed indeed. ETA approx. The landing time is five. Oh, I mean, I've got it on my time. A um, bit more than an hour and a half. I think. Let me check on the stream and see how. This, how. Yeah, it's so. I'm I'm in EST right now, and it's going to be three fifty five. Uh, okay. JPL stream is just is just saying live commentary without anything um, about what it is. So presumably that's got some audio, but let's not let's not leave it if it's just audio. Let's see if we wait till they have some video showing up, and then have a look at that. Possible things that could go wrong. Lots of things could go wrong. I think we'll save a lot of these landing questions for the EDL sequence. Um, Ooh, no, I can hear the audio. There we go. They've started. Let's turn that down. Oh, we can tally, actually. Okay. So, JPL's is going. That's good news. Um, so, what, what just started there is the official NASA stream. So, we are ahead of NASA uh, in many ways. <laughs> um, not least speed of starting stream. Um, we will, at some point when they start doing uh, useful video rather than just talking heads, we'll switch over to their stream and broadcast that with our commentary. Um, so there was another question. Um, I think at 8.11. Oh. Can you take a look at that, uh, Sam, by Malik? 8.11, yes, sure. Okay. Sorry, that's on my uh, eight eleven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Um, oh, I see. I see Cameron's in the uh, yeah, Cameron's here. The chat. Do you, as well. do you want to answer the geology one, Henry, about um about flooding near the equator and Ooh, sure, which, South Pole? Oh, no. This is at five minutes ago. Yeah. So there's there's a few areas like Eris Valles where we landed Pathfinder, where there was these huge flooding events that possibly happened all at once that we're just left alone for you know 500 million years a billion years um those aren't really as interesting because we like sitting water um we like we like to know that the water's been there for at least like 10 million years or something because then because then maybe life formed um but uh yeah the exact water line <laughs> around the Martian dichotomy is very interesting. I've seen a few different interpretations that the USGS has made. That's a big debate. Um, but but generally, you want to go around the dichotomy because if you go too north, like where Viking 2 landed in Utopia Pranisha, there's no unconformities. There's no areas where the geology has dictated like a break in the terrain where you might find interesting minerals, where you might find a fossil or so, something insane like that. Uh, whereas at um, Jezero Crater, you have cliff faces. Uh, you have these pretty massive outcrops. Uh, you have outflow channels. You really have everything. Um, and 
yeah, I was about to go on a rant about the terrain relative navigation, but we should, we should talk about yes, that Yes, we'll save that. Um, people are asking in multiple ways what we'll get in terms of live images and updates. Um, we will have the live mission control feed, which in my view is the most interesting parts because you get to see the engineers doing their job. Um, there will be status updates from the rover as it does that. Um, it does something called the heartbeat signal, which is a regular just, I'm doing okay, I'm doing okay, very small amount of data from that. So we'll know if it's landed, we'll know kind of how it's doing and what its progress is through the descent profile. Um, if we are lucky, we'll get some videos or photos even within about, I believe, half an hour of the landing. Um, you're very much hamstrung by the amount of bandwidth you can fit onto your satellites this far out. And the actual very final phase of the descent will be done entirely with Earth occluded by the horizon. So it, it's actually setting after Earth sets or maybe before Earth rise. I'm not entirely sure um, where it's rotating from. So we will get absolute confirmation that it's fine or not fine if it, that, if we get to that. Um, and we may get some images, but it depends on if the cameras were working fine, if the radios were working fine. So by tomorrow, we'll have photos, almost certainly. But in the immediately after landing, we're not entirely sure. Yeah, I remember what the... I just rewatched the Curiosity stream just to, just to see exactly what it'll look like because the profile is going to be very similar. Uh, but with Curiosity, it was something like five to ten minutes later, we already had an image. And it wasn't a great image. It was literally just an image of like just below the rover because they're, they're interested in seeing what the ground is like, making you know, orienting themselves a little bit. So to a lot of people, it's kind of like that, that kind of looks boring. They're expecting this huge panorama and they get like a rock and a wheel. Um, but still, that's that's all I need, basically. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to have, yeah, we have like direct UHF for... I don't know what percent of the descent, but yeah, you're right. Right at the end, uh, the Earth is going to set and we're not going to be able to get data directly from the rover, but we're going to have MRO and MAVEN data the whole time. And the MRO data is going to be coming back live um, or as live as you can, given that the speed of light is finite. That's, yeah, that's a very good point. We need to remember that even though we're seeing people on the edge of their seats, this all happened 20 minutes ago. It Like... Um, is this very weird thing like the mission control can't do anything um even if even if it were to go wrong it's not like they can press the big red button to abort the landing as it was with apollo um like the rovers it, it, it blows your mind working out that hang on so the rover hasn't actually it's there it's not there yet it'll be there 20 minutes before we will but then send commands it's 40 minutes round trip it's really really mind-blowing um Landing sites and crater dimensions. I can tell you the first one with certainty because I have a ruler here, um, which is that the crater is about 30 miles, 45 kilometers across. Um, what's the height of... That's a good point about the height of the walls. I actually don't know that. I'll check that for you, Henry. Um, or actually not Henry. It was Amanda asking about that. And Henry, do you want to talk about the landing site exactly and what sure, the exact yeah. target it is? So it's in... They're going to land near the Delta. Uh, in West uh, Joe's Rope Crater. So if you go to a CTX mosaic, you can sort of zoom in. Yeah, right where your mouse is right now, that's the landing ellipse. And it's a pretty big landing ellipse. So, uh, you know, again, we have the terrain relative navigation stuff. So we don't know exactly where it's going to land right now, but somewhere around where, uh, you know, where it says East 77, 22 arc minutes around there, but it could be five kilometers this way, five kilometers that way. Uh, there's a lot of variables here. Yeah, somewhere somewhere around that line, north or south a little bit. Um, yeah, the, it, this is a very complicated thing because uh, when the Curiosity rover landed, it landed in a place called Aeolus Palace in Gale Crater. And Aeolus Palace is incredibly flat, um, which makes things very easy. Um, but of course, then you need to drive further to get to the interesting parts because we're interested in the giant outcrops and the cliffs and all that. Uh, so with the Perseverance rover, they're kind of rolling the dice a little bit. Uh, and they've developed a whole new terrain relative navigation system that should allow them to uh, pick a landing site a lot quicker and uh, move a lot more laterally when it's in its power descent descent stage um, and hopefully not hit a cliff. 
Um, so we'll see how that goes. And I, I trust the engineers a lot. But ideally, we would land somewhere like just south of that alluvial fan so that we're not in danger of falling off a cliff, but we're also right next to it so that we can see all of it immediately. That would be, that would be the dream. Um, but also, it might land on top of it. Now, who, who knows? I think I'm going to uh, share the results of the poll here. Oh, I think you're um, muted, Sam. A billion miles away. Uh, so, Henry uh, and or uh, Sam, I think uh, uh, Malik uh, can't unmute himself. Uh, one of you can, uh, hopefully. Uh, can you help him out? So he can be a co-host, maybe? There we go. I'm unmuted. Okay. What I've just pulled up um, to answer the question about the terrain is a cross section through the through the through the crater. Um, and this shows pretty well. It's about 500 meters climb, give or take. You can see me scrolling across here about how I'm pretty sure that red marker is the the peak of the crater wall. And I don't know if you can quite see the scale too well, but it's it's about 500 700 meters climb. So it's it's not a it's a it's a pretty chunky mountain, but if you go across to along the riverbed, it flattens out an awful lot to like only a few hundred meters, and they can always of course weave back and forth on the on the surface to kind of climb. That's the plan with Curiosity to do that to sort of weave around to get up up the hills of Mount Sharp. And um, to be clear, uh, Sam, uh, as I understand it, uh, the road the route is actually as you draw it right now through the riverbed, or maybe Henry knows, uh, just so the inclination is not too much, I guess. Uh, the, the route itself is already known, right? What the they want to. Pretty well. Not, I mean, the, the satellite imagery is, is of medium um, fidelity. It's not amazing. Uh, I'm seeing someone is unmuted. Um, yeah, the, the satellite is of medium um, fidelity. So they have decent mapping. Um, they can say that there's probably a cliff in this part of the world. Um, but a lot of this will be done on the ground. They'll say, what can we see from the rover? Um, it's got its own has cams. It can work out what's around it. Um, totally done sort of effectively live. Or well, not live, but they'll, they'll, they'll work out on the ground as they're, as they're going. I was just trying to figure out who to mute there. Yeah. Um, question, question from Sean. Do you maybe? Uh, the maybe regular that, density. Yeah. I think it's going to be pretty similar to Gale Crater because they were both ancient lakes that had water for similar amounts of time. Um, so if it's anything like Gale Crater, what we're going to see is a lot of like sandstone outcrops, uh, a lot of basalt and rich sand dunes sort of flowing around that we're going to try desperately to avoid. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. I think it. I think it'll be pretty similar in terms of regular density uh, to Gale Crater. There's going to be a lot of dust too, of course. And one of the um, great things about this terrain navigation tool is that we can, to some extent, avoid that, which I'm, we have to talk about at some point. Another we'll thing about, that's. Uh, oh, sorry. You go ahead. Yeah, I think we'll we'll talk through the landing sequence at, at some point in the next half hour or so. Just go through what's happening step like step by step, and talk about all the fun fun toys involved with that. Another thing that's that's a really uh, interesting change from Curiosity is that if everything goes well uh, and we pull out the helicopter too, that's really going to help in terms of route planning. That's one of the big things they want to use it for, uh, pulling out ingenuity and you know flying it 500 meters ahead and just seeing what's there and planning the route using that. Um, they think that could almost like double the speed that they travel because they don't have to stop every two meters, look around, make sure they're in the right place, make sure they haven't gone somewhere wrong. Instead, now they can just they can just drive because they have this helicopter in front of them that's scouting everything out for them. Um, so, so potentially, you know, we have a rough idea of uh, where it's going to be going. It's going to be going up that alluvial fan into that channel, uh, but potentially ingenuity the helicopter finds something cool it could divert the whole route a little bit you know who knows 
so Cameron uh, says that the teams are going through the go no go sequence. So is this maybe a nice time to at least uh, show that part, or is that uh, yeah, not interesting? Switch, let's switch over to that and have a look. Uh, if I change my share over to the Asa stream, and then unmute that. Thank you, Swati. As we just heard, Perseverance is now operating on its own as it cruises closer to Mars. To help explain what this mission means for the agency is NASA's Associate Administrator, Thomas Zerbukin. Okay. No, that's, that's that then. Um, back to Mars. Should we talk to the landing profile? It seems, it seems a good time um, to. Sorry, just one question. Um, you were talking about climbing slopes before. Do you have an idea of what's the maximum inclination the rover can handle? Ooh, I'm actually not sure. I know that I remember writing a post about uh, the Spirit rover and how it tackled this crazy slope once, but I, I don't remember the exact incline. Something like 20 degrees. Maybe, maybe it was less it's, than that. Maybe it's yeah. numbers. I think they've gotten more capable since then, but it's that order of magnitude. It's probably equivalent to what you'd be comfortable walking up give or take um does it, does, does it matter uh the weight and the current mass of the of the newest rover which is a lot more does that make it harder or maybe even easier to get more grip um well they've really they've redesigned the wheels quite a lot um with curiosity the wheels were quite a new thing because it was so big um they didn't really know what they were doing to be perfectly honest they they took a, a very good crack at it and they've had a lot of problems with fatigue and crack formation on their wheels um, so they've pretty much gone back to the drawing board with these wheels. They're um, a pretty different form factor, and um, they are hoping they should survive the terrain a lot better. Um, they're not the shape memory alloy wheels that everyone loves so much. Um, in, in theory, the European Chase Rover will have those, have um, those really advanced wheels, but they're just solid aluminium, um, nothing too fancy. They're designed to survive a pretty good long time on the surface, um, unlike what Curiosity has had. I think the, the slope that it can take also depends on the terrain. Um, for example, they're really afraid of sand dunes because they don't know how deep they are, and that's what killed the Spirit Rover. Uh, so they're really, whenever they see sand dunes, they try to avoid them, and if they have to go through them, they never tackle a larger slope than they have to. Um, but if they're on something like sandstone, they're a lot more comfortable pushing the limits and going you know, whatever, 20 degrees inclined. Yeah. Should we talk about about sample sample missions and then go into landing sequence? That seems like a nice nice two-part thing. Sure. So, yeah. Per, um, Perseverance is part of the sample return like program, vaguely. It's, it's all a bit up in the air because it's a 10-year-long mission between two agencies, so it's always going to be fluffy. But it's the first... I mean, it's got hardware that is designed to return hot like part of the sample return mission. Um, does someone else want to take the stuff about how it works on Percy and I'll explain about the the, the retrieval side because I've been really into that. Sure. Uh, so the thing that Perseverance is going to do that Curiosity didn't do is that uh, it's when it takes samples and analyzes them, sometimes the team is going to decide uh, to use one of the canisters that they have to package up the sample, triple seal it, like align it in a particular way so that we can find it. I think that, like the rover points north and they have to like do do some like voodoo magic basically. And then they drop off uh, the sample. Um, and so there's going to be like a trail basically. I forget how many canisters they have exactly. Some, some, maybe like 20, something like that. Um, but yeah, this, this is something that Curiosity didn't do. Um, and you, yeah, you can talk about the, the return. Yeah, so so after it's done this sort of um, this trail of these little canisters, which are about I think I think it's forty of them I remember, if I remember correctly. Um, I can't. I, I think I, I think there's a difference between how many storage points it has and how many actual canisters it has. So there's a bit of confusion if I if I'm correct. Um, it has these little canisters that are test tube sized ish, and then the idea is that in 2024. There'll be another launch. Um, I don't know what what, what it'll launch on, um, but there'll be another launch, which is a big chunky lander. I and mean, we don't do landers. For, we don't do landers as often on Mars. Um, this is a big, uh, like a like. It's actually fairly similar to who was it? Um, the one that had Sojourner on board. Who had Sojourner on board? 
Um, or Sojourner was um, that was Pathfinder. Yeah, yes, yeah. that, that was the one in Aerith's Palace. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be similar to that, and it'll be a lander that then has a rover on board rather than a dedicated rover and sky crane. Um, and the plan is, uh, ESA, European Space Agency, is building that rover. It's called the Chase Rover, which is, I think is fun. Uh, it should be a lot faster than the existing rovers. It'll have the terrain pretty well mapped out already by Curios- by Percy, so it should be able to do that a lot faster. And the idea is it just runs along the path that Perseverance went along and just picks up these samples. It won't have any real science on boards. It'll have some cameras, um, but it's basically just there to pick up the rubbish. Um, and then it runs back um, to where it landed, and it loads these into a sample return vehicle. Um, and this will be most likely, unless something very surprising happens, um, the first vehicle launched back to Martian orbit from the surface. Um, the plan is for it to be a two-stage solid rocket motor, so solid, solid rockets, um, both stages solid, which is quite fun. Um, five minutes of the spin, thank you, Cameron. That means we, oh, that's that's early. Um, so it'll launch, carry back to this this um, launcher, which, if I understand correctly, and if I've read it correctly, will be the smallest ever thing to reach orbit around a celestial body, excluding like comets and asteroids. Um, the lunar sample returns did direct return to Earth. They didn't go into orbit first. So it's this teeny weeny little um, rocket, essentially, that will then launch autonomously off the planet, um, go into orbit, and then get picked up by a third craft, because you have to have three missions, you know, rule of three. Um, and that'll be picked up and scooped into a sample return container, similar to the sample return containers that NASA's used a lot in the past, and then taken back to Earth. So in theory, 2031, we should have samples being landed, which is crazy. <laughs> um, that uh, rendezvous between the sample who just launched off Mars and the orbital craft which brings it back to Earth, that would be a first as well. Yeah, I think so. I'm pretty sure it'll be a first like autonomous uh, rendezvous system. Um, Chris, you're asking if there's any active rovers. Yeah, there's um, one active rover in the form of Curiosity. Um, the other ones have all um, sadly, sadly left left the left this not even this planet. They've left the other planet. Um, and there's also uh, High Rise, not High Rise. I'm going crazy. Insight, which is a static lander station, um, which is designed entirely for uh, mostly for doing seismic data, but some weather data as well. What will happen to it? They'll keep running it. Um, Curiosity can keep going for years in theory. Um, it'll go till the wheels break down and then, then it'll be a static station, most likely. Well, it have the same problem uh, looking at the, the dust uh, that could uh, happen during storms? Uh, it shouldn't. Yeah. It, it's radioactive as well. It's got an RTG, um, same as Perseverance, so it can run through dust storms just fine. Um, it will probably, at some, I mean, at some point, it, it will break down and fail. The, the, the RTGs are using plutonium 235? No. Can't remember which plutonium. One of the plutoniums. 239. Um, 239, thank you. Um, which has a half-life of hundreds of, of decades. So um, that'll keep going for a very long time. It's more likely that either it'll sort of get dusted up in moving parts, in the cam, in the, the mass or something like that. Also, like not to... Uh derail this discussion a little bit too much um but the curiosity rover and and the perseverance rover both weigh about one metric ton about a thousand kilograms um so starship could land about a hundred of those on the martian surface so it's possible long before curiosity dies it becomes obsolete because we have you know not that anyone actually would go out of their way to develop a hundred billion dollar curiosity rovers and just put them around the surface but it's po- very possible in the next decade we're going to have a lot more of these mars rovers so it, it's possible before curiosity uh goes silent it it isn't as uh as vital to our yeah. study of we, mars we are entering the age of, of super heavy lift cheap rockets um can in i the, ask in you guys before. 
uh, one specific thing about that because uh, I think SpaceX has uh, asked uh, for the option to also use uh, plutonium and other radioactive materials on their rockets uh, or propulsion. But now I hear that uh, this uh, rover on the surface uh, will already have been launched with a radioactive uh, payload. Why can't SpaceX do that? I mean, there's an engineering reason, there's a politics reason. Um, I can do the engineering reason. And the engineering reason is that these RTGs have a tiny amount of plutonium in them. Um, they've got, I, I think it might be two kilograms, and it's it's uranium plutonium dioxide, which is designed as a material to be very survivable in the event of a launch failure. Um, and it's just running, pa- it's just it's just hot from radioactive decay. Um, so it's only producing about 100, 110 watts, I believe, on Percy. Um and what we usually talk about when we're talking about nuclear propulsion or large-scale nuclear rockets or nuclear exploration is actual reactors. Um, whether the, And there's been exploration about this before. Uh, NASA's Killer Power program is about a kind of dustbin-sized Stirling engine, if people know what that is, which is an actual reactor rather than just an RTG. Um, nuclear thermal rockets, which everyone loves, is actually a, a fully functional core, like a, um, a reactor core rather than just a lump. So... When SpaceX often talk about we want nuclear rockets, they're not talking about something of this scale. Even with the whole questions about, um, ooh, despin. Even with the whole things about um, com- about politics and private companies, the solid engineering reason is that it's a very different kind of thing. Yes, there's also another factor. Um, an RTG is just slowly decaying. The level of radioactive activity is low. While something has just been in a fission reactor is extremely radioactive, at least for 10 days up to a month. And something extremely radioactive is not something you want flying around, especially during you know, launch operations. Also, I'd like to correct myself. Indeed, it is plutonium-238, which is used in an RTG. It's plutonium-239 in nuclear bombs and reactors. <laughs> OK. Here we go. OK. Um, given that D-spin just happened, should we do landing sequence, do we think? Talk through what happens? Sure, let's go for it. Okay, so we've just had the first item on the UAE. So the UAE is um, it's not landing, Mark. It's, um, it's just staying in orbit. The, 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 the videos of the, the, the footage even is very, very good, and it's high altitude, which is very nice. Um, so yeah, I, love it, um, I love yeah. it because it diversifies the images that I post on Areology because I post <laughs> so many by high rise, which are of like a static, like the enhanced images are always one kilometer. Then I have the curiosity images, the opportunity spirit images, which is up close. But the hope uh, orbiter, it, it's it has an, a you know a very eccentric orbit, so it can get full pictures of Mars, um, which is what. Uh, was it MOM, Mars Orbiting Mission, the uh, Indian spacecraft that can get images like that too. Um, but yeah, those are really cool. Hopefully we get more pictures from Tianwen-1 as well. Yeah, because we had some very nice, that, that um, orbit insertion video was very nice. So yeah, let's talk through the sequence. So right now, um, Perseverance is in the aero shell. You've got, the, you've got the rover, you've got the heat shield underneath it, the aero shell on top of it, and then the cruise module, which is has some engines, it's got some fuel, it's got some antennas. Um, that's currently hurtling towards Mars at ridiculous speed, however many thousand miles an hour, I forget exactly, and it's increasing by the minute. Um, and it's spinning as it does so uh, for stability um, in order to keep it pointing correctly. This is completely standard. All spacecraft do this. Um and it's beginning despin now. And it'll go through a number of despins using its engines. Um, it's got, I presume, hydrogen thrusters, I'm not actually sure, um, to spin it down. And then just before the landing, um, so just before it hits the atmospheric barrier, um, it will eject the cruise stage, which is all that hardware that's behind the aeroshell. Um, so it's exposed. That'll just fly off. That'll just burn up on on entry. Um, and then you're kind of into the atmosphere. And Henry, I'll pass to you to talk the next bit. 
Sure. Uh, so thank you for giving me like the really cool part. Um, so there's uh, a few different things that it does once it gets into the atmosphere. Um, it does like super wide turns, or I guess they're tight. Uh, yeah, the other way, the super tight turns. Curiosity did the same thing. If you watch, uh, they have um, a bunch of thrusters on the outside that control it spin, sort of like spinning like a football. Um, once it's at um, Mach 1.7, and I think that's about 10 kilometers high, it's going to deploy its parachute, which is this crazy big, you know, I think the one in Perseverance is the largest parachute ever, or largest parachute that's ever been used on, okay, nice, camera, thanks. Um, so it's this massive parachute. Hopefully we're going to get some pictures of the parachute from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, because we did get crazy pictures where you see the parachute fully unfurled um, with the Curiosity landing. Um, so then uh, it's parachuting down, parachuting down, but it's still going like uh, a few hundred kilometers per hour, even when it's fully slowed down by the parachutes. The atmosphere is just too thin. Um, so then once it gets uh, to a certain point, I forget how many meters it is, uh, like a few, maybe it's a, a kilometer or something like that. That's when it the power descent stage detaches. So yeah, uh, the parachute backshell lets go of the rover and it drops with the power descent stage. And then it has. Yeah, um, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interfere. Um, I just heard over the mission control talk that they did a checkup and the rover is still on course. Okay, that's sure. good to hear. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm taking a bet, Henry, you, I'm talking about this bit. Um, so terrain relative navigation is the the really fun bit that um, the Perseverance has, that Curiosity didn't, and is something that we can presume every single lander in the future will have. Um, okay, the landing, I'll get to that in a second, Aram. Um, we're not going to be seeing landing live, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, terrain relative navigation is using radar and visual cameras um, and going back to the existing data we have from the, R, from the reconnaissance orbiter um, and working out with machine learning where it is. Um, and this wasn't a thing that existed in Curiosity's day. Like we didn't have, um, there was no sophisticated machine learning that could be put onto a spaceship in this way, in this kind of spacecraft. Um, so that's completely new. And the idea is that this, this will allow it to, as it comes down to land, as well as do just coming down vertically, um, it'll actually steer a bit as well. Um, I don't know exactly now what it's steering for. It's got its landing ellipse, which it'll be aiming for. Um, it'll also be doing avoidance of rock fields, cliffs, dune fields, that kind of thing. Um, at this stage, it's still the rover and the sky crane, which is, I think, four or six thrusters coming down like this. Then it gets it just above the ground, and then it does the crazy bit, where it, so you can see my hands, it lowers it down like so on some cables. KSP um, bit. The, yeah, the bit that everyone said they'd be crazy for doing and it worked. The reason for this is because they don't want to throw up dust. If you were to land with these engines with a ton of equipment um, on the surface, you'd throw up a massive dust cloud, which would get in your moving parts, get in your antennas, and generally be a bad time. So the Sky Crane solution lets them do that, lets them avoid that completely. Um, just plop the thing on the surface and then fly away. Video feed. Okay, Aram, I am sorry to disappoint you. We're not going to get live video. The reason being that we have very limited bandwidth to Mars. Um, the What the rover will be sending is, I believe, a few kilobits per second of um, status reports. So just pinging us every second with how it's doing, if there's any problems, what mode it's in, and so forth. Um, that's what we'll be seeing in Mission Control. What our stream will be will be a stream of the mission controllers um, watching their monitors in fear and fear and desperation, waiting for things to happen, um, and then hopefully cheering at the at the end. Um, we might, if we're lucky, get some footage of the landing within about half an hour of the landing itself. Um, that depends on how well the orbiters get the signal, because at the actual moment of landing, we're going to have the Earth will be below the horizon, so we're relying on a, a bounce via. I think the MRO or maybe Maven. I'm not yeah, it's the sure. MRO. Well, both both will be MRO. connected with it at that time. But the data we're going to get back immediately is from the MRO. Okay. So we will definitely have confirmation of landing. If we're lucky, in about half an hour afterwards, we will have um, 
some photos of it coming down. That might just be a picture from the underside looking down and saying, look, a rock. Or it might be some footage out looking out the back shell as it descends. Yeah, um, certainly really within a few days, we're going to have that video like we did for Curiosity, where you see the back shell and you can, you can see all the terrain kilometers up. That's going to be really amazing. Yeah. Um, and with sound this time, we have microphones on board. Yeah. Yeah. Two microphones, I think. And I yeah, think they even exactly. have dozens or even a dozen or more cameras in total. Uh, would I be correct to assume that they will record this in HD, for instance, and then maybe take uh, a half a year to send every <laughs> high quality data back to Earth? Or is that not yeah. the way it goes? There's definitely going to be HD video. I remember for Curiosity, that video of the back show was something like 10 frames a second. And I know that they've upgraded that a lot since then. Um, but yeah, for people who are curious about the descent, uh, it's worth just like making very clear uh, that this is entirely hands off. So like we're not controlling anything. If we get, if we for some reason the MRO, Maven, they both break, and we get no telemetry, uh, it would be kind of annoying. But it would still land on its own. It's it's controlling yeah. itself at this point because and, there is a twenty minute time delay after all. Like there's nothing course. we can do. Um, so we're going to be getting I think it's eight kilobits per second, which is like half dial up. I wouldn't really know, um, <laughs> but so something like half dial-up. So it's really, really poor. Uh, and the computer onboard Curiosity is like, or Perseverance and Curiosity, both of them have the same computer, is like a 1997 Mac radiation hardened computer. So it's going to be yes. trying desperately not to crash. It has no time to send back HD videos of anything. It's going to be trying not to make a new crater on the surface. Um, so, so the conclusion is that uh, something like Starlink uh, or Kuiper <laughs> project is really, really uh, handy uh, for future missions if you want to see that uh, live, quote unquote. Yeah. Yeah. Not just that, but also um, some big relay sats. That's what we're really missing. Um, lots of people are looking at detail about like big optical links, big laser links between the between some Lagrange points of Earth and, Earth and Mars so you can get past the sun. Um, there's some active work being done on that to see if that's possible or useful in the near term. But we should be looking very, you know, hopefully, at that. Funny bouncy landing method, because that didn't work. Rest in peace. Can, can, <laughs> I, can I just ask, uh, the, the relay satellites uh, would be, I guess, also required to uh, make sure that when the Earth and Mars are on the opposite side, opposite side of the sun that would also be a problem i guess yeah the idea is uh, never... but but yeah. during landing normally uh in a normal rendezvous uh, uh in the pork shop uh, moments that we uh, go to mars uh, that is not a problem right at landing it shouldn't be no but they will if we're going for longer term missions or human missions we will need um as zach is said in the chat the mars telecommunications orbiter there are many people thinking about this kind of stuff um yeah, if we and, could have something sitting in heliocentric orbit, that'd be really helpful too. Um, because yeah, I think I've seen L five, like um, I think Earth, Mars, Sun, Mars, L five. Yeah, it would be really helpful because um, if you ever look at uh, this, might be getting way too off track. But if you if you ever look at, uh, at it's called what's called a pork chop plot, which shows uh, basically when you can leave uh, on like a home and transfer to get to Mars, and which is every like twenty four months or something like that. Uh, there's actually two windows for most of the time. So all of the orbiters that we saw, uh, all the orbiters, landers, Perseverance, Hope, Tianwen-1, they left in July, like early August, July. But there's actually another window that they could have left uh, in October. So you could say, oh, why don't you just, you know, if you miss August, why don't you just wait till October? And the big problem is uh, it would take longer to get there. And when it got there, uh, it would be at the opposite side of the sun. And now you can't communicate with the rover, which would really suck. Yeah. Um, but if we had some kind of satellite sitting in heliocentric orbit at the L5 or whatever uh, Lagrange point it might be, that would be really useful. Is all yeah. this similar to that uh, Mars internet discussion? Uh, yeah, it's all, it's all in the same kind of field. And also what would maybe help future missions uh, as well as the landing, I guess, of uh, starships and other missions uh, would be to create a local uh, 
well, it's not GPS, maybe uh, M- MPS, I don't know, um, uh, but the positioning system. So you could actually really know very accurately uh, and you would need, I don't know, maybe 12 satellites or so, and then you could have accurate. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That would be really, I mean, it'd be amazing. To you. I know um, myself and Cameron, who is also looking in the call here, are um, working on some Mars scouting robots that have to have a local positioning system. Um, which uses these fairly cl- um, clunky and not particularly effective um, triangulation towers, effectively, to, to work out where they are in, in a small region. Um, a Martian GPS system would be an absolute godsend for this kind of thing. Yeah, so if you could use that uh, at the same time as extremely high latency uh, internet uh, uh, and a relay network, uh, that would be very helpful. You could make those satellites all in one, maybe. Okay, so uh, is there maybe is it maybe nice uh, to show a video of the landing sequence? So, like, shall I look that up, or uh, is that? Uh... I think I can find that if you give me a second. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I might do that also because I have got some food waiting for me here. So I'm in the UK, so it's it's just past dinner time for me. Um, but I will find that video while putting us back on picture of Mars, I think, um, and then I will try and find that video for us. That's working. So it looks like we're about one hour landing. The current uh, NASA stream might be worthwhile to put up uh, for now, uh, Sam. Indeed. And light up our rockets. Uh, Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way the down to interjection. the ground. Uh, That's when we oh. start the sky. Once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will cut loose from the rover and fly away to a safe distance. But surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. Its job, right, being the first leg of sample return to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. And then that's when the real mission begins. Well, that is some uh, awesome background music. Well, it is an epic mission. With us now is Al Chen. He is Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing um, lead. Grant, Al- asking, you're asking if we can video. I think we're on, are we streaming on YouTube now currently, Felix? Or is that not working yet? So that should be, is that, that will record it, right? Yeah, we are streaming and it will be available afterwards on the Beyond Media channel. If okay. you want to check that one out, we also did a series of interviews with some people you might want to look at so yeah it will definitely be recorded and you can look at it afterwards in them we would not be able to drive out of and there are rocks to the east and actually all over the place rock fields uh, that would be a bad day for us if we were to land on them now Al, what new technology makes this type of land dangerous landing possible perseverance is carrying two new technologies that are really kind of under the hood smarts that are allowing us to and at this kind of treacherous landing site. Uh, the first is range trigger. Uh, that's the ability, we've given Perseverance the ability to decide for herself, based on where she is, when to deploy the parachute. Previously, we used to deploy parachutes, that supersonic parachute, based just on navigated velocity. But now Perseverance has the smarts to figure out where she is and deploy that parachute at just the right place to make sure that uh, we shrink where we could come down. That actually reduces the area, that error ellipse, the, where we can come down on the ground. Uh, from something that was on the order of 15 miles long by 12 miles wide for curiosity uh, to about five miles long by four miles wide uh, for perseverance. So that's quite a bit of reduction. Second, uh, the next piece of technology that's helping us land there is terrain relative navigation. Um, In the past, after we popped off the heat shield, we've taken pictures of the ground as it's been coming up, but we haven't really done anything with them. This time, Perseverance is carrying a camera to take pictures, but also a kind of second brain uh, to help it figure out what those pictures are telling it and match it up with an onboard map from a satellite. Uh, that allows it to figure out exactly where she is. Uh, suddenly then, she can, she can then fly to safe spots that are nearby once she really knows where she is. 
It allows the site to not have to be as flat and boring as a pancake, as if some of our past sites have been, the entire area we could come down. Now we just need little pieces of that site to be small enough and safe enough uh, for us to land in safely and fly there after we've, just, after we've gotten rid of the parachute. And we also have a social media question coming in. Sansakari14 on Instagram is asking, how does the sky crane decide where to move itself after the payload lands? After the payload lands, after the rover touches down, uh, the, the sky crane, the descent stage, which is that rocket-powered jetpack above it, the first job, of course, is to make sure you don't hurt the rover. So it'll turn forward or backward uh, so that the engine plumes don't pass over the rover. So it'll come up and start to turn. And it'll go in whichever direction is closest to north. So it can either go forward, if that's the way north is, or go toward the rear of the rover, if that's where north is. And it'll fly about a third of a mile or so away. Thanks for talking to us today, Al. Thank you very much. Now, let's head back to Mission Control for an update from SWATI. Hi, Raquel. So, remember that command that we sent at around 11.35 to turn the transmitter off? We are just about to get confirmation that Perseverance has received the command. The command took 11 minutes to go to Perseverance, and then the reply took 11 minutes to get back from Perseverance to the ground, so we should hear uh, any second now that uh, we have officially turned off the transmitter. And after that, we will be about four minutes from the start of entry, descent, and landing mode. At this point, we will transition from the cruise approach mode to entry, descent, and landing. And that means our travel from Earth to Mars is done, and now we just need to get to the surface. So far, things are looking good. Great. There we go. So we're very close out. Um, we're talking about ending that the, the um, ending the cruise phase, starting the EDL phase very soon, um, which is very good news. That means it's all going fairly well so far. Do we know if there's any small adjustments to the trajectory all the way throughout the approach to Mars? I believe there is. Um, I, I, so the last actual major course correction maneuver was a few. It was in. It was ages ago. It was in like December. Um, so they they do big corrections, but they will be doing slight corrections um, to orientation as they come down. Henry mentioned it's got that big sort of sweeping turn, the sort of S turn it does to try and slow down faster. Um, I believe that's adjusted slightly if they have different, um, depending on how they're how they're um, working. So, I believe that's how that works. Rover mission has helped shape the other, starting with the landing of the Pathfinder more than 20 years ago, leading up to where we are today with Perseverance. Perseverance Deputy Project Manager Jennifer Trosper has worked on every Mars rover mission, and she joins us now. Uh, Jennifer, how does Perseverance fit into the history of exploring Mars? Thanks for coming. Well, course corrections. Um, well, Perseverance is NASA's good question, actually. I'm not entirely sure. rover on Mars, and I've had the privilege of working on every one of them. And the very first rover was the Sojourner rover we sent in 1997, and it was the size of a microwave oven. And even at that small size, Sojourner was able to transform the way that we explore Mars from stationary landers to small roving robots that go from place to place, just like a geologist would on Earth. So once we had that roving capability, then we sent our twin rovers Spirit and Opportunity. Spirit and Opportunity were tasked with finding evidence of ancient water on Mars. Now they did. They're great explorers and both of them found ample evidence that water had once existed on the surface of Mars. But we had a question, another question then, was Mars ever habitable if water had been there? And that's when we sent Curiosity. Now, Curiosity was a major upgrade to our rover fleet. She's the size of a small car. She uh, landed with the sky crane system instead of airbags. And she also carries along her own sample analytics lab, and she's still operating today. And during her exploration, she has found evidence of a habitable environment in an ancient lake bed on Mars. So now we're sending Perseverance. Perseverance is tasked 
with answering the question and looking for evidence of ancient microbial life on Mars. And in order to do this, she has to be the smartest and most capable rover we've ever sent. Speaking of Perseverance, can you tell us more about how Perseverance is smarter than its predecessors? Yes, we've made a lot of upgrades to help her along with the surface mission. One of them is for her autonomous traverse capability. When I say autonomous traverse, I mean we tell her where we want what her I to What I just learned up now, by the way, is uh, NASA Eyes on the Solar System, which is a program they put out, um, which will, should let us able, be able to see what see the current state of the, of the rover. Upgraded the cameras and we've upgraded the algorithms. Now she drives three times as fast as Curiosity could drive in this autonomous traverse mode. In fact, her average daily distance for driving, about 200 meters, is close to the maximum distance any rover has ever driven in a day on Mars. So she's fast. Another thing that we've done, which is the most significant upgrade that we've made, is the sample caching system itself. Curiosity has a robotic arm, like Perseverance has a robotic arm, but on the end of Perseverance's robotic arm is a coring drill that will go and take rock cores, transfer them into sample tubes and into the rover, where another robotic arm will take those tubes, will seal them and store them, and eventually drop them on the surface of Mars for future return to Earth. Great. And we also have a social media question about Perseverance. Erica AS on Instagram wants to know what the wheels of the rover are made out of. Great question. Well, you may think we make them out of some material you've never heard of. It turns out they're made of aluminum. Now, Perseverance's wheels are a little thicker than Curiosity's, but they're actually both made out of aluminum. And one more question for you. Can you tell us more about the importance of where you are right now in the building? Yes, I am above, on the second floor, above the cruise mission support area that you've been watching. And this is the surface mission support area. So as soon as Perseverance lands, all commands, all ta all, this, this room will take over. It will become headquarters for operating Perseverance on Mars. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Jennifer. Thank you. Now, we now know Perseverance's place in history. Just to point out a few things Let's here. Um, this show goes very nicely to cruise stage. You can see uh, Sam, here. Sam, can okay, you please mute no the lady in the background? Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, yeah. Thank so you, okay. uh, mute yeah, in front of them. Okay. Is that visible? It just looks blank to me. It's oh, a black yeah. screen uh, uh, for us now. Is that loading? Uh, so maybe just go out of uh, full screen. Yeah, it's probably full screen. Yeah, there this is fine. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So this is a program called now, NASA. Now it is, a, it is gone again. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Full screen. Ah, oh, that's a pain. Yep. There um, we go. This is a program called NASA Eyes on the Solar System, um, which they run. Um, it's got lots of real time simulations of their spacecraft. And this is the current location of Percy relative to Mars. And it gives you a really good sense. Of it. It's actually still really high up. Like, if you look at the disc, like this is, I don't think human missions apart from Apollo have gone this high um, relative to the planet. So it's still coming in from a very high altitude. Um, it's spinning nice and slowly. Um, it's already done a few de spin maneuvers, but it'll have a few more left. Um, and you can see very nicely here what the crew stage is. So it's got solar panels here pointing towards the sun. Um, you can see the little RCS thrusters there. That's what's used to orient and de spin it. Um, and there are some bigger engines used for course correction. And then you, you can't see because it's dark here. That's the air shell and that's the heat shield. Um, so we're looking at a bit over an hour to landing. Um, Make sure you press uh, the button in the middle bottom because you're two minutes behind on that simulation. Oh, uh, press press live. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter too much for now. But uh, once oh, we yeah, land, okay. yeah. it does. Yeah. So this is very nice. This gives us some progress updates to how it's doing. Um, we can actually scroll down and see what it's, you can see what it'll do next. This is now ahead of schedule. Um, so it'll do its D spin, it'll do its, it'll eject some masses, it'll then hit entry interface. Um, and you can see by this point, this is in a few, this is in about half an hour or so. It's coming in and nice and close. You can see it's got the landing site now in view. And then it comes through. And we're not going to go any further because that'll spoil it. Um, we'll go back to the live. So in about five, in about, Half an hour, we'll have another D-spin. D -spin. So it's it's fairly just pretty much just sitting here for now. So I'll turn the audio from Mission Control back on. 
and we'll enjoy this this view of it because I think it's better than than just interviewing people. Unless Henry, you've got anything else to say? Um, I um, actually have a question. Yeah. Um, do you know what sort of fuels it uses for its uh, little thrusters right now? The ones used for the D spin or the terminal maneuvers? I would very much presume hydrazine. Um, I don't know if it's monoprop or biprop, but hydrazine is used, is pretty much the go-to store propellant for this kind of thing. I can check that in the meantime. Would that cause some sort of toxic contamination on the craft? That would make it somewhat perhaps dangerous for, uh, let's say, a human crew to touch it years later? Well, so in the tanks, yes, hydrazine is very nasty stuff. Um, if you Google it, the image of it used to be... Um, someone fueling up the, I think, messenger, wearing pretty much a full spacesuit to fuel this, the, the, the vehicle with hydrazine. It's very, very toxic. It's like most rocket fuel, it's not stuff you want to have in your skin. Um, but it burns to just nitrogen. Um, it, I mean, it burns by itself to nitrogen and hydrogen, um, or maybe ammonia, I'm actually not sure. Maybe nitrogen and hydrogen, they're fairly inert compounds. If you burn it with um, NTO, uh, which is usually burnt with a kind of nitric acid, um, a nitrogen tetroxide. Even it just burns to nit- it burns completely inert things. So um, you could poke the aeroshell after an engine is fired, and it would be pretty inert. It might be a bit warm, but it, you, there'd be nothing to. There you go. Thank you. Makes N two N. Yeah, hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonia. Thank you very much for that, um, Zach. Um, so the after it would have fired, it would be pretty much inert, and it's very volatile, so it would evaporate off very quickly as well. Um, this is the stuff that Mark Watney used in, in The Martian um, mm, yes. to get his water, which, again, is not advisable. Don't do that, people. <laughs> if you're ever in a situation like that, uh, first ask how you got there, and then don't play with hydrazine, because um, it's it's very, very toxic and carcinogenic and bad for you in many ways. Is this the same fuel used on the descent crane? I presume so. Um, hydrazine is kind of the go-to. Uh, it's a really, really good fuel. And my camera's off. Good point. So, um, theoretically, yeah, it's... when the sky crane launches off and crashes somewhere far away, there will be a landing site with unburned hydrazine. Yeah, presumably. Um, but then very... again... The it, next it, chance that humans would go and touch it is like in five years, and by then you said you would have bored it off. I suspect it would have either broken down. Again, it's very reactive. It, it, it may sort of... It will probably have reacted away, is my suspicion. Um, it being... I mean, hydrogen, as a monopropellant, it's usually put over a catalyst to cause it to decompose into its gases. Um, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's enough metals and metal oxides lying around in the Martian surface that it just catalyzes itself and essentially turns into turns into gas. Um, might, nice. might also be interesting for the people uh, in this Zoom call to know uh, about the carcinogenic um, situation of uh, the actual surface of Mars itself, yes. uh, right? Uh, because let, uh, we're talking about this uh, hydrazine, yeah. but uh, yeah. everything you see is actually carcinogenic. Henry, you want to you tell us about that? That's your, that's your field. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, Mars has a very unhealthy amount of perchlorate salts mixed in with the soil pretty evenly, even to a depth of like a meter. Um, and perchlorates are pretty nasty stuff. Uh, just all of the you know, toxic, carcinogenic, uh, just all of the above, uh, basically. Um, and it's the kind of thing where, you know, if we ever wanted to grow plants, we would have to uh, sift the soil and get all of the perchlorates out. Um, so yeah, yeah, forgetting about the hydrogen stuff, I, I'd be much more worried if I was walking around the surface of Mars unprotected. Uh, well, there's many things to be worried about at that point, but I would be very worried about touching the soil. Uh, I, I would guess that the hydrazine and everything would that's probably going to outgas and be pretty safe soon thereafter. Whereas the soil is going to be just as toxic today as it is in five years. Um, yeah, if you've ever seen, there's really interesting, both interesting and horrifying videos of um, the uh, long march rockets, China's uh, rocket, like the first stage. Uh, there's a few videos that I found where 
uh, they'll just drop the first stage and accidentally it lands in like a semi-populated area, like a, a fairly populated town. And there's all these people just walking around it and this this fuel tank is just leaking hydrazine, UDMH everywhere. Um, so that's obviously a bad situation, but uh, yeah, the, it'll be pretty inert, you know, probably uh, at the very least like a month after or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I recall that um, certain designs for Mars bases, they had these uh, spacesuits which would never, like the outside of the spacesuit would never come in contact with an inferior space. Yeah, suit locks. Specifically because of how dangerous the outside chemicals are. Yeah, it's called a suit lock. Um, yes, yes. They're really funky. Uh, they're pretty cool. I think they're, they're nice because you can, as you say, you can you don't also need, don't need a full air lock to get, to get in and out of them. Um, you just have a sort of hatch in the back. So you can save a lot of mass in your whole system that way. The pain is that you're limited in the shape of space that you can make. Um I've heard from astronauts who've tried them out experimentally and they are apparently a real pain to get into because you have to sort of wiggle in through the back and then duck your head in and squeeze it up. So it wouldn't be very pleasant to get into. Um, the question is, can you make a good enough spacesuit that is also, it also works that way? The answer is, who knows? Well, there are, um, I believe, these like mechanical counter-pressure suits, which are not inflatable balloons held in a human shape but more exactly, like yeah. a very tight mesh which generates the pressure you need. That was exactly, yeah. easier to put on. That's the alternative, yeah. Um, uh, MCP suits, actually that's what our team in Nexus Aurora looked at um, uh, in our Mars Society competition entry. Um, the reason being, as you say, they're easy to put on um, and they don't ha they're not actually inflated on the inside. They are just, um, they're just, they use uh, the pressure of this sort of mesh um, it's kind of skin tight suit, which means that you're not sort of you don't have to handle nearly as much air as you move in and out, um, and you can repair them on the surface. Like if you get a hole in a spacesuit, um, you're not in not in very uh, having kind of having a bad day. Um, but if your MCP suit gets a hole in it, then you're like pretty much fine as long unless it's in the helmet. Um, yeah, there'll be a reduction in the pressure they exert, but. It's like having a hole in your clothes, it's not that bad. Yeah. I mean, the MCP tears, but that's the point of it. Like, because it's a, because the whole suit is, pre is at pressure, because it's providing pressure with the material, not with a gas. If you get a tear in it that's like the size of your finger, the bit the size of your finger will be exposed to local pressure. But the rest of the suit will be fine, pretty much. They, I mean, it might have like a bit of a running tear, which could be a problem. You need to have metal fibers or whatever to stop that happening. But like I, I, it's, and it's been talked you about might freeze uh, part of your body that is exposed. Yeah, I, guess. I think minor frostbite is is isn't great, but it definitely is better than than losing pressure in a spacesuit. So, so yeah. Sam, uh, maybe you can uh, change to uh, one of the YouTube feeds I sent to you on Discord. Let's uh, go back just to, to have a bit of a, a difference in uh, in view. Up, yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the EEL family. There we go. So this is now the heat mission control, obviously. And with that, Godspeed Perseverance. All right, activity. Go ahead and continue the report. Sure thing, Flight. Um, we've since completed the EDL start anchor. Um, as I was mentioning, we changed our CBM row to EDL reserve two-way non-coherent. That row reinforces our CBM windows disabled keeps our packetization on, it turns off our ranging and switches to the auxiliary oscillator. We have also started our real-time data product and reinforced medley on. At this time, we... Now, we just heard Perseverance team leaders thank the cruise team for their work in guiding the rover to Mars. Now, did you know the rover name and Mars helicopter name came from students? Well, a couple weeks ago, Marina was able to catch up with them. Thanks for catching right. More fluff, I guess. Um, thank you, Cove, for that link. I will try sending up a clean mission control feed. See how that works. Oh, it's the same view we had before. Show it. With the viewplane, if you have it. Thanks. 
Okay, all stations. As with our tradition, we usually would. For some reason, it goes dark when you go full screen. It goes dark at full screen. That's really odd. And, uh, ooh, why is it doing that? Let's That's try. To keep our tradition. I will take oh, there we go. For all of us. I got it. To keep our there we go. It's more like it. Yeah, the 360 cam. I oh, might do that in a bit. Um, this has some audio. That's a dog. <laughs> I mean, this is a long tradition of mission control. Um, amusing things like. The, the amount of silly stuff that the space program gets up to. We we all think it's very serious, but remember, this is astronauts and engineers we're talking about here. So, oh well, this is Tad. It's Green. all a bit silly. Yep. And again, Four these are all spaced out. It's COVID year, so if you watch your Curiosity landing, they were all crammed into the same a, a room, um, shoulder to shoulder, and this time they're all spaced out, which is a real shame. I think yep. we'll use lose some of the euphoria that we had last time around, but. I think, I think they've had here. several months to decide what to put on their desks for this moment. <laughs> yeah. Turn the volume off on this a bit. This is this is the feed that is will have the good information on it. Um, you know, you, don't, you, you like the, the press feed is great, but you want to hear the mission control callouts, so we'll probably stay on this feed to be honest. Um, it'll give us more of what we want to see. So this re-entry will be very similar to that of the Curiosity rover. So do we have good estimates on what the re-entry conditions will be, like the peak temperature or uh, the maximum g-force or something like that? I can answer some of that question. Um, so there is actually an experiment on this. We, we don't know very much about the Martian re-entry conditions. Um, just because the atmosphere is different, as Henry said earlier, um, back at the start of the stream, um, the atmosphere has got a lot more variation than it does on Earth. So it's there's a lot of unknowns about it, and there is an experiment on the Aero shell actually, um, which is designed to measure reentry conditions, uh, to measure the air temperature, pressure, heat flux, and so on. Um, we know that with Curiosity, I think peak G-loading was about 10 or 11 Gs, if I remember correctly. Um, that kind of thing. But we don't, but there is a lot of unknowns. Ooh, my stream is buffering. Um, there are a lot of unknowns. So this, I think it's called... Henry, you watch the thing. Is it Medley or Melody, the re-entry experiment? Or medley, yeah. Medley. Um, yeah, M-E-D-L-I. -E yeah. Medley is the experiment that, that's that's working to observe the, observe the re-entry conditions in a bit more detail. Um, that's interesting. Because I know that, like reentry on Earth, the temperature, the peak temperature is like ten thousand degrees. It doesn't matter which degrees you use; it's more than ten thousand. Uh, and at those temperatures, the air itself breaks down into a plasma, including very reactive oxygen. And I'm thinking on Mars, the the condition, the aerochemistry is different, as in its carbon dioxide. And then you'd have a different breakdown of plasma and all that. And this data would be crucial to the sort of reentry that Starship will do later. That's a very good point. I didn't think As in, that. this mission will directly assist the Starship going to Mars. Yeah. Well, Medley absolutely will. Um, um, also, uh, unless we have that. something updated we want to show in the next couple of minutes, we're about to turn over our WebEx screen to Telecom for Tones. At that point, okay. I'm happy to get updates um, in chat in our WebEx on EDL Ops, but I'd prefer to not have any more call-outs over the net unless you see something you do not expect. Okay, so that sounds like the saying is going to go to something pre-recorded, at least on the mainstream, but I think it should stay on this mission control. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think the plasma would be different. I guess it would. I don't know if... Because there is some oxygen on Mars, and I know that it may be similar to Earth where you have... Distance to target, 392 meters. Ooh, that was a call-out. So what we should have is they're 400 meters off target, um, which is very good. So their, their solution that they're getting from their guidance systems um, and ground imaging saying they're 400 meters off target... That's very good news. Entering steep of normal. I, th I think this is normal steepness, as far as I can tell. It 
Unless you heard a caller that I missed. It's 11 minute delay, Mark. Just seeing the chat. Yeah, you're right, Malik. The the entry question is different. You're, this does directly inform Starship, you're right. Um, and every other future Mars mission. Because they... They don't like. Um, they were talking about how they um, they overbuild the heat shields because they don't know the conditions exactly, um, and they reckon they could shave like 30 40 percent off the heat shield mass if they knew with detail what was happening, um, and they don't. So medley could be really really significant in that regard um, in telling us how this works. This is a fun view. Uh, this is from something you can see live yourself actually. Um, if you Google DSN now, it's called. This is NASA's Deep Space Network doing its thing um, with all the antennas around the world in Goldstone in the US, Madrid, and Canberra in Australia. Um, you can see they're talking to Juno, uh, which is JNO, uh, SOHO, which is a solar orbiter, um, CHD, CHDR, Henry, that's the. Is that Chandra, the uh, X ray observatory? I think. Oh, where is it? CHD. I'm CHDR. not sure. Yeah, I guess that's Chandra. Yeah. Um, but. As you can see, well, basically everyone here is talking about um, is talking to Mars, pretty much. Yeah, Mars um, reconnaissance orbiter. MVN is the Maven, uh, like upper atmosphere explorer thing. We're going to be getting a lot of good data from Maven. Yeah, and M twenty is is Mars twenty twenty, so that's perseverance. Can I ask uh, maybe a strange question? But is it possible to send data using these large dishes, or is it only possible to receive? No, they're sending too. This is how they're sending their controls to the spacecraft. Um, all of these are transmission and receiving. You can actually see on it very nicely how um, Dish 65 in Madrid is doing trans is doing receiving from Mars o M O10. I don't know what that is, and Maven. Oh, it's gone. But you can see, if you go on go on DSN now as a website, um, and you can actually it shows you which ones are receiving and transmitting from where, which is very nice as an effect. W would it help uh, if there would be? Um these kinds of dishes may be in later time uh, sent up uh, into space uh, for the quality of that uh, information, or does it not matter too much? I mean, I can only, I mean, more dishes is better than fewer dishes, as a rule of thumb. Um, but these are massive. These are like 70, 80 meter dishes at Goldstone, at least. Um, the DSN antenna are really tremendously large. Um, I can say that uh, addition orbit can use a shorter frequency, which is not absorbed by water in the atmosphere. And the shorter frequency uses both a smaller dish and gathers more information. Of course, it would be massively expensive. <laughs> yeah. Assembly of the vehicle as we go through. We need to uh, uh, get rid of the things we don't need anymore. And, uh, uh, so I'm pretty sure what we're hearing now is someone talking to the press. Um, um, it sounds like a script of line here. things that we're doing here uh, is ensuring that our ACS knowledge is... So a really interesting notch. question that Ahmed has in, in the chat. Um, how do they not know that it's been damaged? Um, so could we, uh, could we turn the audio off for a second so that we could answer? Yeah, sure. Um, down to the ground. Yeah, this is a really interesting uh, question. They uh, like the, they say in the chat, there's loads of sensors, hazard cams, um, but I think the, the best way to think about it is like, it, it's incredibly unlikely that like it's either going to create a crater, like impact so hard that it creates a new crater, or it's going to be perfectly fine. There's, it, it's hard to imagine a middle ground where it smashes and then you can still transmit and it's kind of, that, that's uh, so basically if we get like any data back at all we know that it's fine yeah uh, pretty much there may be i mean there may be damaged individual instruments which you will tell by turning it on and then if, if it doesn't work it doesn't work but i i, yeah, I agree but in general you. yeah why is it spinning yeah, if something goes long yeah. with the uh it's spinning something goes wrong with the landing yeah. sequence it's, yeah. it's spinning currently of stabilization um Someone asked, yeah, as you think it's stability, it keeps it passively stable. Um, basically, as a spinning top, it's the same mechanism. Um, it's because it's rota rotating, it means it can't oscillate nearly as much. Otherwise, you'd have to try and actively point it. Um, yeah, American football is another very good example where you have a spinning football which keeps stable. Because um, otherwise, you'd have to try and, if you have something spinning, it has a sort of built in resistance against small oscillations or perturbations from little forces. 
Um, if it was just floating freely, it would slowly drift around. You'd have to spend fuel keeping it pointed towards Earth all of a sudden, which it doesn't have to now. When it is spinning, uh, any perturbation on one side is cancelled out on the other side as it spins. So that's the main thing. Yeah. You, you know what uh, What I just realized? Uh, the James Webb Telescope, I guess, will finally launch this year, I think. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but the interesting thing is that uh, if you use that same method of un unfolding mirrors, and you would launch that on a 9-meter fairing diameter like a Starship, you could even launch like a 30, 40 meter diameter uh, yeah, telescope or uh, oh, whatever. If we're talking about dishes, um, there are already insanely large dishes that have been developed, um, as far as we can tell, by the US military for orbital surveillance and spying on other satellites. Um, we're pretty sure that they have got receiving dishes that are on the order of 30 meters across. Um, which is but but that, that is not without cool. mirrors, but yeah, uh, that's yeah. radio, radio, right? That's radio, which you need if you were doing a, a deep a deep space network in deep space. It's you, a conductive it yeah. aluminium mesh, yes. Yeah, which can actually yeah, you, unfold. Yeah, I suspect that if you wanted to scale up James Webb, um, you'd probably run into issues about the mirror quality before the size. Um, would be my guess, at least. Yeah, it's the right signet dishes. 100 meters, that's bigger than I thought. Yeah, it's signet. Um, signal intelligence is is the people that do this. So we have the technology. For, we have a lot of the technology for a deep space thing. We'll know if it landed safely basically immediately um, with the time delay, obviously. But um, if there's a countdown clock on here, there actually isn't. But um, I don't have any clocks available. Um, we'll know when it in about half an hour or so when it, gets down pretty much immediately that it's landed safely. Let's turn the audio back on, I think. See if we've got anything fun to say. And activity, please call that out when it's ready. Copy, Philip. Lots of things could go wrong. Many, many things could go wrong. Um, it could hit a turbulent air pocket and not enter correctly. Um, its parachute could tangle, which was a concern with um, some of the things. Its parachute could break uh, or have some failure, as happened to Schiaparelli. Um, the heat shield couldn't. The heat shield could fail to come off. The aeroshell could fail to deploy. One of the engines could fail to work. The sky crane could break. It could crash into the side of a hill at high speed. Many, many, many things could go wrong with this. And at this point, let's limit our traffic on the net to critical issues only. That's painful. But, painful to hear. Yeah. Uh, all I'm of sorry. These I'm sorry. Yeah. I have failure modes are on my mind. Um, but again, this is a proven technology. It worked very well on Curiosity. It worked pretty much flawlessly. As per step um, two of five in the OCP, uh, we can confirm that MRO also not to be like s throw a lot of shade at any at any space agency. But NASA has a fairly decent recent track record of successfully landing. Um, Don't call ESA out like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I had. To. Yeah, yeah. Schiaparelli was a, a big, big mistake. Um, yeah, but yeah, you're right. Really sad as well. Successful landing. Uh, we had a poll earlier that was 95%. Um, NASA won't say less than 100 because it's NASA. Um, but yeah, it's a very high landing chance. Um, it would be a major, major upset if this went wrong. The eyes, I'm pretty sure, will be with the time delay for with the, with the light speed light delay. I'd be surprised if they hadn't if they hadn't synced it up like that. Um, and IVP, and we guess. are now propagating via the DIMU. We've powered on our UHF, but it's not yet transmitting, and the anchor has complete. We expect our ne next anchor to start in two minutes. Two minutes, next event. Copy activity. Yeah, you're right. It's one data point. Yeah, I mean, these. yeah, it's been tested very thoroughly. It's been simulated very thoroughly. We hope it's going to go right. All the evidence is that it'll go right. So we'll see. Uh, Cohen, do you have a link to the, the clean mission control audio feed? Someone was asking for it in the chat. Yeah, I'll po paste it. Great, thank you. Phase two, taking a battery change. While we have this brief moment before we're going to go into crazy entry, descent and landing mode, I wanted to take a second to... Uh, 
to tell all of the American listeners that we have that Krispy Kreme has a limited edition today only Mars donut. And this isn't a sponsored message or anything, but I walked 40 blocks in the snow to get one. And I was the only one who showed up to get it. And they were so excited. They took a picture with me and everything because <laughs> I had like a NASA sweatshirt on. Um, but yeah, if you live near a Krispy Kreme, they may or may not have the limited edition donuts. I have a bunch of them still here. They're pretty good. Yeah, they look like Mars and everything. I don't know if, I guess Europeans don't really, do you guys have Krispy Kreme? I guess, I don't know, probably not, but. N not yeah, yet. We do have uh, Krispy Kreme in the UK, but you know, none of the stores are open. Here we are reinforcing the beef. They're like caramel and they have chocolate on the inside. Uh, so they're very good. I'm actually curious about one thing, watching the mission control room. What actions are they able or willing to do in the next half hour? Well, they, they can't in, do anything, right? There's yeah. a time delay. Regardless of the time delay, they might have, you know, some strange telemetry. But what can they actually do about it? They're always going to say, go ahead, try a landing. Because there's no second go. There's no abort. There's no... I don't know, correction perhaps at most of the trajectory, but other than that, it's, it's just um, go, go, go. The vehicle so there was a, a go, no go decision earlier. Um, I'm not sure they would do the end of a no go. It may just be a thing they do for tradition's sake. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that, but yeah, I think it's largely there just to provide to, to, for the press. Pretty much, or, or to make sure that they they know everything there is to know about it. Yeah, because um, what happens if there's a no go? They're like, all right, <laughs> but like there's right. absolutely nothing bring, they could do. They can't bring go it back orbit. in. <laughs> We're powering off the crew stage device. Yeah, I presume it would be too, yeah because it, it was a few hours ago, too late to go to an orbital. If it was a few days before, they could probably divert it to a like a high error rate pass and come into orbit. But it's not a satellite. That it's not designed to operate in orbit. It's got no instruments that could be functional in in, in orbit. Um, you could, just for, for comedy's sake, release the rover in orbit. It'd be quite fun. Um, yeah, it's in the sort it. of orbit orbital debris fun. Yeah, <laughs> with one ton impactor in orbit. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be very well. It'd be very easy to track. It's got a massive radioactive source on it. You could pick it up with um, pick it up very easily. Yes, so um, the debris afterwards will be radioactive as well. That as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Henry, uh, can you tell us maybe... Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, no, after you were done eating. No, no. Crew I'll stage ask... separation in three minutes, guys. Ooh, three That's minutes. Big. Okay, so then, then a big. short okay. question to Henry or Sam. Uh, what's the actual uh, Garmin line for Mars? Where does the atmosphere get? It is already extremely thin, but is there like a 100 kilometer line as well from Mars before you are in space? Or That's a very good question. Um, so yeah, I mean, like you said, um, less than 1% Earth sea level atmospheric pressure. It's about 610 to 640 pascals, and we're at 101 kilopascals. So it's like 0.6%. It's like but uh, the thing about sort of atmospheres is that it's bound by the gravity. So there's 38% gravity on Mars, and that means that the atmosphere starts way higher than you would expect given the thickness of the atmosphere because it's just holding onto it less tightly. Um, so the equivalent sort of Kármán line would probably be around 150 kilometers. But uh, again, it's so thin that I don't know, I don't know if you'd really notice yeah, no, and um, you could you could even say that the Kármán line itself is arbitrary as well. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, yeah, it, it depends. You, you can draw space in a lot of ways. I can say this because of my current rocketry society, we're saying we're going to space, air quotes, um, which may be the fifty mile line or the hundred kilometer line, depending on how good the rocket is. Um, but yeah, it's kind of fluffy, and because this is coming in not from orbit, but from a sort of, it's coming in from in an in an escape trajectory, hopefully. It's kind of different. They have their own definition of the entry interface, the which they'll call out at some point. Um, tones. These yeah, tones the re-entry interface attitude is 125 kilometers on Mars. Is that in this case? The general yeah. case. No, um, so 
So apparently, I'm, I'm reading this answer here. It says, uh, the entry interface actually from our source of 105 kilometers wide for Apollo, it was 122. Uh, and this is mostly to do with uh, atmospheric drag and reentry heating then. The Kármán line, I believe the Kármán line is defined as the ratio of lift to uh, centrifugal force. Yeah, it's, it's the point at which you'd have to be going faster than orbital velocity to stay up through lift, which is so, kind of a weird definition. Um, uh, well, it, it, it grew from Air Force test yeah the program so yeah, yeah it makes sense in his historical context but it's and the fact that it is almost exactly 100 kilometers is just a nice coincidence rcs timing so, so there's our answer uh Ooh, oh, there, there we, we go. go yeah career stage gone so now you can see the error show over nice and clearly um crew stage is up I'm not sure if the markings shown here are actually just representative or if they are showing where the medley experiments are. Um, there are a number of experiments that sort of poke up through the through the aeroshell to measure heat flux. We'll on. wake up and begin the final preparations for entry. The first action it will do is to fire warm up pulses with its entry thrusters. These pulses ensure that the spacecraft gets the thrust that it wants during yeah. entry interface. Separation. Yep. Nine minutes from and they're confirming that they, they this is going exactly the same as um the curiosity entry. They're about to start despinning it with the thrusters in the aeroshell. This also helps as well as actually um as well as actually despinning it. It means they can make sure that their thrusters are working perfectly and that they've got uh fuel in the lines that's all working very well. So this is a sort of multi purpose thing. It's I don't think they thing. use sorry. Do they use uh, weights? I thought they used thrusters for this. Yeah, I think they have they have tungsten weights on there that they eject to change their center of mass. I think that's as well, though. Yeah, that's as well. Yeah, the thrusters are the main thing that's controlling. Um, yeah. indicated actually that we could see. Yeah. Which is um, bizarre. I, when I first read about it, I think it's like something like two hundred kilograms of weights on this on this mission, um, which feels bizarre. During that, you're like, come on, just put a cube out there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, uh, I was going to say it was a bit funny uh, thinking about stuff like vapor in the fuel lines and uh, warm-up pulses for the RCS. It's the sort of thing you never encounter in usual space simulators or even just reading. Like, even the most detailed realistic science fiction never considers these little details from a real science fiction. Yeah. Go back uh, to the... To the 3D animation, please, because now you see that the uh, the spin has completely stopped. Oh, there we go. I'll I'll, I'll do a mission control. I'll do the mission control feed because it's got the audio and it's got nice visuals as well. But you can see we're much closer into the disc now. We're really coming in. Well, yeah, yeah, or show them side by side. Even I don't know. Ooh, that, I'll see if I can get that working. We're about seven and a half minutes from entry interface. Seven and a half minutes until entry. So. Yeah, that, there we go. So we're getting close. Wasn't paying attention to the time. We got 15 minutes to landing. Wow. Okay. Uh, is that a useful? We're point already going 10,000 miles an hour. Here we go. That's. A, I think that's a pretty good feed. We happy with this? Oh, you can't see that. Um, let me. Uh, don't do anything full screen. Just have uh, two separate screens, I guess. Yeah, that's there great. Oh, sorry, come around. Encourage everyone to oh, do whatever. It, it, uh, it was. Yeah, no, it lost that. Yeah, it lost it. Sorry. See the carrier on the downlink. Yep. Great. There we go. So we've got some a little bit of telemetry here. A little bit of. We are continuing to wait here. for entry interface. We're about six minutes and forty-five seconds from entry interface. We have confirmation so Sam, you're telling me that uh, the 3D animation that we're seeing on the left of the screen is actually done for many other missions as well. Or what type yeah, of this, missions? This is something that they, as they provide, called eyes on the solar system. It's available at all times as a free visualizer. It's on the web. Um, it's, it's on the web. You can just go to it at any time and have a look at where missions are. Um, you can see sort of what various satellites can see from their current position which is quite cool you can also see here actually quite nicely that it's going to have to do this s turn to get to its landing site which is over there and it's coming in on on this vector so it's going to have to do this this s turn in order to get over to the landing site 
and what's the idea behind that? Because uh, it wants to have a sort of a straight line into the most even terrain, I guess. I presume it is firstly to help bleed off speed. If you're if you're S turning, then you're you're losing more speed because you're going on a further distance to the atmosphere. Um, and also because you can't just arbitrarily target a point from your orbit. Um, there are because of where they're launching from Earth, you have to come in on a certain angle. And I presume this is as close as they can reasonably get. So probably some combination of those two things. About 90 seconds prior to entry, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should begin receiving telemetry from Perseverance and streaming it to Earth in near real time. I'm going to shut up now because uh, this is going. A few kidding. unexpected short outages. Such I as encourage everyone to do their superstition, whatever. I'm wearing have my lucky do. socks, so I think we should be fine. I have my Mars globe. <laughs> Wishes can overcome the light speed lag. Like. <laughs> That's a good point. It's, it has already landed. Yeah, that I was just or thinking not. like touch touchdown yeah. eleven minutes, right? It's yeah. about the same. It is it, it is about to in, in real time somewhere out That's there. That's horrifying. Hit the ground. From a relativistic perspective, this is like the Schrodinger situation. Yeah. I don't know if it's landed or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> Schrodinger's Mars rover. Perseverance continues to report heartbeat tones indicating we should hear the message in uh, is the audio feed all right? Can I try I can try and turn it up a bit more if it's not it's a bit quiet. Uh, it's okay, but if we talk, of course, it's difficult. Uh, it it was fine before. I don't hear anything now, but it might yeah. be because of the stream itself. They're, they're being quiet, I think. Camera reports the electro radio is powered on, ready to receive signals from the lander. I'll just leave it then. Mars Reconnaissance's orbiter has reported that it's ready to receive the signal from Perseverance. It should be in a few minutes here. We're just Flight local minutes one. from entry interface. Around this time, a second spacecraft, MAVEN, should begin picking up telemetry from Perseverance and will continue to record that telemetry until several minutes post-landing. We won't get that data for several hours after landing as it's being recorded and then will be forwarded to Earth later. We are continuing to receive heartbeat tones, indicating that everything is nominal. We're currently at about three minutes until entry interface. Zach, I'm glad you said that about um, KSP, which is that. So yeah, this looks like KSP because it's got the the outside view, but they just mentioned heartbeat tones, um, which is very significant because that's the only thing they know about the, about the lander right now is the fact that they're getting these heartbeat tones. Um, I believe it is, uh, I think, 256 bits of information every second, so it's a tremendously slow transfer rate, um, or maybe it's 256 bytes. I'm not actually sure. But it's a little trickle of information coming back at a high frequency. It means they know it's doing all right. And that's all they know about this. And all the telemetry is constructed from that, not from anything else. We're just under two minutes from entry interface. As it gets closer to Mars, Perseverance is actually being pulled in by gravity and accelerating. By the time Perseverance reaches entry interface point, she should be going just under 5.4 kilometers per second. We're at about 90 seconds from entry interface and standing by for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to pick up the telemetry. It's actually speeding up. Yes, it's being pulled into Mars by its gravity. So look at how quickly the altitude uh, changes. Right really, now, really it should be experiencing significant aerodynamics, as in there yeah. is drag, significant drag right now. Uh, on it's it's almost at the top speed then, so it's going to slow down the amount of speed it gains, and 
the altitude is is dropping very very quickly yeah it says 45 seconds until it hits the atmosphere and then we got seven minutes until it lands yeah and if you know how atmospheres work the density of the atmosphere is actually increasing exponentially right now now relaying data from perseverance we're about 30 seconds from entry interface Perseverance is going about 5.2 kilometers per second and is about 190 kilometers altitude above the surface of Mars. Confirm your that's still well. slower than Earth re-entry, or entry, which is interesting. It's still going slow. Ooh, there's the font telemetry. Uh, it's still going slower than spacecraft enter Earth. 5.3 kilometers per second and an altitude It's in miles per hour, just watch out for that. Yeah, even so. I think, I think or is it, it's definitely comparable, if not the same. Um, and we're in. Okay. We're in the atmosphere. I'm going to shut up. Entry. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The fit is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars to slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. Doppler indicates entry into the atmosphere. Navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown. Yeah, it's now slowing down, yeah. The atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing MRO plasma blackout at this point. Plasma blackout, this is the, the communication drop. Tank one completed. You can see it steering here, where it's spinning around. This is, in effect, real time of the steering. MRO has lost lock. Probably indicate. Reversal, bank reversal. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control... The spinning steers it because it's, it's, it's mass-oriented, it's oriented in one direction. So by steering it, it changes its heading overall, basically. The point of maximum I can show you, actually, by turning this bit. Indicated that if the G-forces, look how quickly it's decelerating. Yeah, you can see it's how it's not... crazy. It's not head on to do its vector, and that's just because of its mass. It's not being steered that way. So by rolling, it can take that angle and steer it in one direction or the other. I think also, I think curiosity was 11g, and this looks comparable, I guess. So Henry, uh, don't forget to breathe. Uh, just a reminder, gentle. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control. You see the high res crater there. Lovely reversal. End of range control, range minus 1.9 kilometers, cross range minus 2.4 kilometers. 2.4 kilometers cross range. Perseverance is going about 1 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers. It, from it stays at almost the same altitude now. See that? Yeah. Was, it, I, I think at this point it's, it's using lifting body effect to, to stay level, which is what spacecraft on Earth do as well to, to re-enter more gently. The target on Mars, but instead is there's Jezero Crater. The there she is. You can see I the fan cake there. when we're landing. <laughs> Coming up close now. Mach 2.7, still going exceedingly fast. Our current velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. So we're now Sky at about... Crane soon. Yeah, we're now at about plane flying height, give or take. We are coming upon the... Start. We are starting the straighten up and fly right... GBMD, Jenison. 
where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in Ooh, preparation for the parachute deploy and to roll over to and get a better look at the ground. In the cage, shoot deploy. Shoot deploy. That's very good news. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude okay. of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Okay. Oh, there it went. Each separation. That was fast. Yep. You can see on the on, on the JPL feed they've actually got that checklist they're going through. Heat shield set. Uh, Sam, can you rotate uh, to the underside? And the heat shield sure. Has there we go. There he is. So it's, it's uh, there doing is. the terrain navigation. Oh, is he doing that now? Yeah, it's scanning right now. Oh, oh, oh. that's why the heat. It's like a lens. The heat shield. Yeah, yeah. Lens. And a half kilometers above the surface. Okay, this is insane. I know it's just an animation, oh, but it's awesome. We had an angle that we're right above the fans now. Yeah, this is so much approved over Curiosity's telemetry. Yeah. Is this is this actually a telemetry sent back and uh, updated in the 3D model? I think yeah, this is simulated, but J, the JPL one is... 3.3 meters per second. Yeah, on the right side, it's actually uh, kilometers. Yeah, real time. Well, uh, semi. Velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 kilometers of the surface. There we go. Image acquisition is going. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up. Valid solution found. Okay. The initialization of terrain Hopefully that's actually correct at this point. And subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Live camera field of view. Okay. Oh, 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 Jesus. Oh, oh. oh yes, valid. Wait, is this simulated? I have no idea. It it must be simulated. Simulated. I think the, must the, be left, the left one is simulated, but the right one is likely actually what they get as a feed. We have timing of the landing engines. It's so close to a cliff. Yeah. Like from this that must be simulated, though. That's... It must be simulated. Okay. Back is this ahead of time? And, and, and we don't... Set, back shell set. We, we just heard. We don't know the scale, of course. So. Yeah. That might be ahead of time. The empowered approach. Yeah, okay. The I'm trusting yeah, the, the animation on the left is faster than reality. Yeah. Of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. I'm going to full screen this one. Bravo. Yeah, take the right one only, please. We have yep. completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. FPS level. Constant velocity accordion. Constant velocity accordion. Altitude. <sighs> We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to earth tones. Throttle down. Sky crane maneuver has started. Bruh. About 20 meters. Tango off. Delta. Touch down. Tango Delta is touch down. Set. We're down. We're getting signals. We're down. Okay. okay. Wait, 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 wait. They we are not cheering. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Touchdown confirmed. Come on. There yes. we go. Oh, yeah. Ready to begin taking the sand. Woo -hoo. The oh, man, we don't need to go to the cinema anymore. We've got way better thrillers over here. Yeah, man, this is awesome. Ooh, I wasn't breathing for the past two minutes. <laughs> wow. Safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to and now cake. Yes. Through Mars reconnaissance. Wish I got some cake. That would be, that would be a good idea. Congrats, uh, guys. Yeah. That's, and now uh, I think that's another over. achievement uh, by mankind. Yeah. Now I'm pretty we sure if you wait for the has cam picture. Well, I'm pretty sure if, cool. if you look at the other room they they pan over to, this is the landing room. The next room is the surface ops room. So they're going to hand over straight away to surface operations. Course, still getting telemetry from the lander. Yes. Okay, that's a good sign. That's a really good sign. Right, yeah, it's doing telemetry. Touchdown confirmed. We're going to wait for the images. Okay, image time. So we're going to hang on the stream now and wait for the images to come through. Whew. Whew. I need some water. I actually. just want to say hey real quick to the 31 people watching us on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, you're, you're probably getting a stream delay on a stream delay. Yeah, you, you can join us on Zoom if you want. The link is in the video description.
So right now it's going to like set diagnosis. Am I broken? How does it look? You have what you need? Hello, Flight. three, I have what I need. Flight, we have seen the completion of EDL 3000. Copy. Copy activity. That is as expected. <sighs> so it's all nominal now at this point. So now, now we basically just wait. Emerald is still seeing a strong signal from the lander. <sighs> Flight, oh, that's that sigh of relief. <laughs> ready to... <laughs> Stressful for <laughs> us, and we haven't been working on it well, for so 10 years, know. so. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Bradley. This, this Thank must be a career-defining moment for them. Absolutely. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you very much for hanging out with us. Yes! Watch, watch. Do they have images? What's... Yes, there we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a so nice... You, go, you, uh, asked, you asked for images. <laughs> there is our image. That's, that's Areology's post for a moment. Yeah, there well, should be, I think. I have uh, the target point on the map when you are ready. We are ready, OL3. Oh, yeah, where is it? I want to know where it is. Well, I think that image is probably the has cams. So that's probably like just below behind the rover. Um, Yay! Ooh, is that entering the map? Presumably. Flight, I'll be uh, moving in, showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. There we go. Looks pretty good to me. Yeah, that looks oh. that looks awesome. Left front has come. Oh wow! Ooh, oh, and there's uh, train, the train navigation map we just saw for a second there. Oh, flight. Yes, yes, on the right. Yeah, you can see it's worked out the areas that are bad to land on. That's remarkable. And it only had like a few seconds to do so. To watch the re-entry, it did it like 10 seconds. <laughs> Someone just chanting TR. Everyone's <laughs> <lost you>. enchanted. <laughs> get train around navigation. Can we get that one? Show us a map. Um, oh, so are they going through the sequences of... Is this going through as a time lapse now? Of image by image? Activity, this is OL. Can you repeat that request on M20 EDLR? Yeah, look at that. Oh, you can, can see it's, it's, the image should show the clip. it's mapped out where to land. That's remarkable. I'm sorry, say what image again? I'm not understanding. Flight OL3. <laughs> OL3. Uh, you can see uh, we've landed about uh, 35 meters from the nearest rocks that we could identify from orbit by their shadows. Awesome. Copy OL3, PRN in action. Yep. I want them to give the coordinates when I'm loading up Google Earth Pro right now. <laughs> I wonder how they know the coordinates, though, if they're, if they're working backwards, okay. surely. <laughs> you can hear how relieved they all Copy are. OL3. Uh, I'm sure that you have seen them all. Oh, they got more. Rear has come as well. <laughs> so, you can, so this is these must be coming down more or less live, pretty much. So it's it's actually a decent data rate to get this through. Presumably, right? Flight force electric still in lock with the lander. Flight, we have seen the transition to surface. EDL is done. Woo! Transition to surface. All stations are. <laughs> Congratulations, Perseverance team, and the whole team that's not here as well. Excellent job. Did they just say transition to MRO? Uh, presumably, some kind of data transfer, I assume. Okay. Yeah, Zach, exactly right. This is when your parents say, Are you fine? You go, I'm fine. Don't worry. <laughs> Spot on. Oh, that guy, a guy, um, the uh, East Asian guy who was just in the camera. That's um, Al. Uh, What's his name again? Al. I forget. Al Chen. Uh, Al Chen, uh, Chen who's the chief landing engineer. The um, he was the guy who gave all the commentary for the Curiosity landing. Yes. Uh, and he's now in charge, which is very fun. See, so this room, this is where they're doing surface operations from. So this is where it suddenly gets very, very busy. 
Oh, they're going to have a long night. Yeah. Or they, they go to Martian time. They're working on... They said that they that for the first, at least for the first few weeks, the science team is going to be working um, on the Martian clock in order to have full operations every single day. Basically, 25 hour days nearly. Yeah. It's going to be very weird to work in that mission control room. It's going to just drift. Right. But they're going to be powered by sheer awesome and caffeine. <laughs> Absolutely. So, do we know what's next? So, what's the rover doing now, and what's his first thing going to be? First, thoughts. Well, I, I, we heard on the call out that they have some rocks that they identified from orbit, and I, so they know where they are, and I'm assuming they're going to go check out those rocks. That would be my best bet. They're also going to take a full panorama. It's probably going to come out tomorrow. And we're, in a couple of days, at least, we're going to have the full... Descent video HD with audio this time too. That's going to be awesome. So, in essence, the the rover landed pretty much warm and ready to go. Yeah, yeah. There's not there's not a whole lot of setup. Uh, one, required. Dale, two, voice check. Pretty amazing. I think that RTG is is really Hello helping. Everybody, I've because I remember the, 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 uh, there was another landing report. mission where you had to uh, wait I've a few hours for the stone panels to deploy and all that. I'm waiting inputs from a and couple people still, much, no. and confirmation. Oh, you go on your wheels. <laughs> yeah. You always want it to, to, to let the, you get the square grain to land it rolling so it just hits a head start. That's right. It's ready for yeah, I mean, review. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check okay. Mars 24 right now to see what time it is in the Martian day. But like, if they really wanted to, they could just, <laughs> just start driving around. Yeah. Uh, I assume they'll do a full uh, checkout at this point there to make sure it's all email. fine. I've sent out an email that they can reply to. Thank you. I'm pretty sure we can see the guy in the back there. Uh, what's his name? Mission director. Um, oh, what's the guy's name, Henry? You'll know, you'll know this guy's name. The guy in charge of the engineering mission. Um, who has oh. really, like, quiffed up hair. Who I forget. Oh. I want to say Adam. That might not be Adam, though. Yeah, I've heard, I've I went to a, a um a lecture from him at the Royal Institution in London a few years ago, talking about curiosity, talking about and he was talking about this mission as this far off thing that he would one day be perhaps in charge of or perhaps contribute to. And now he's in charge of it, and he's a really, he's a really really awesome guy. Thank you to everyone who's thanking us for the watch party. It's it's a blast for us as well. So thanks thanks for joining and helping doing it with us. Yeah, this is this is pretty fun. Uh, it's first thing I've done something. First time I've done something like this, and I'm learning a lot from you guys. And you know a lot about Mars, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I dropped a a link. Uh, in the, the, get, uh, which actually shows the sort of the landing circle, uh, right. which I found on Twitter, and uh, where we actually landed. So a little bit to the bottom right of that. Uh, the latest one I have is 137. I, can I don't know the scale of this, but... Uh, last one. 4548. Uh, a little bit to the right of the center. Oh, yeah, there we go. Top one, we're yeah. So if this was the actual landing site, which oh, I... That's... I'm yeah, not well, sure about, but that's uh, what I get. If they were aiming for the middle, that would be a pretty remarkable landing if they got that. Had one, yeah, but had it's two. strange to me if they would have been aiming for such a sharply edged uh, rock uh, part, but uh, apparently they did. Well, it's very hard to tell from, from here. There's there's a very fun case of this in other parts of Mars from satellite imagery, where it's really deceptive as to where the shadows are. Um, so there's, there's things that look like rivers on the surface from satellites. And then you do the the synthetic, synthetic aperture radar over, and it's actually a ridge. And the theory is that it was, it's actually an ancient riverbed that was laid down by there was a river was flowing there, which compressed the sediment down to something that was more rigid than the stuff around it, and that was eroded away, left with this ridge that looks exactly like a river. So it could be that there's actually not as steep as it looks. It's just a change change in the um a change in the in the rock type rather than something else. Yeah, that's yeah. a surprisingly common thing, inverted channels on Mars. 
I remember, you know, that's that's something I post a lot on areology, and I would say like inverted channel, and people say, Sorry, "Do you mean a ridge?" It's like, no, no, there's a very specific like Nita, mechanism I of uh, sediment being deposited, hardening, uh, and all that. Cancel that last Monte Carlo uh, before we start this one, Go or if I should get Monte Carlo. Uh, that's a good question, uh, actually. Yeah. I wonder what Monte Carlo is all they're talking about. Uh, how far along is it? Oh, so there you can see there quickly that that has come, that trade navigation thing. That's remarkable that it got that, presumably in half a second of processing, while falling through falling through the air. I'll go ahead and kill it. Yeah, I was really, like, uh, especially interested in uh, seeing uh, the velocity and the altitude, uh, these numbers, uh, and uh, the actual trajectory it takes. So I'm really happy that we could show the... 3D animation actually uh, yeah. sort of live well, uh, I, because it really makes you really understand it a lot better. I'll suspe I suspect it'll still be alive if you want to scroll back and look through it later. It's it's eyes on the solar system if you Google the, the name of it. Um, yeah. It's a really fun program to play with. Yeah. I, it'll uh, probably give you playback. It does. It uh, shows a complete replay. Yeah. It's really awesome. But uh, yeah, it gives you a way better idea and feel about... Uh, where everything is, how fast things are going. And the fact that it sped up that much uh, was very logical in retrospect uh, because of uh, gravity of Mars. Um, but even up to about 100 kilometers altitude, it still was speeding up, no, even more. Like yeah. uh, maybe, maybe like uh, 60, 70 kilometers up, then it was still speeding up. And then friction got uh, to be too much. Yeah. So imagine having to do that all autonomously or design such a system that's really like crazy crazy yeah. engineering well hopefully we're not too many years away from someone being in the seat when that happens a couple of decades perhaps you know so, so what would be like we have these guys here at the nexus aurora and other places <laughs> that are really like martian nuts but i got a daughter and a wife and a house and blah 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 and i'm i'm not planning I would love to be like the first one to go because mm. that would be really worth it. But yeah, second or after that, uh, would you leave everything behind? I would not at this yeah, moment. Yeah, no, I'm, I don't have the astronaut bones in me. I'm, I'm giving me a spanner. And when there's something, when there's enough habitats that you can be fairly safe, I'll go up then. I'm not. Yeah, I, I not. would, I would, uh, if it were not for like, family my my wife and uh, my uh, half year old uh, daughter for instance if i were just uh, on my own and i i would have the money required if it would cost money but that would be at a later stage then i would go i actually uh, uh looked at uh like five years ago or 10 years ago on joining the arctic uh, station Oh. Uh, to to do like uh, half a year uh, because it's always half a year or so and uh, to work there just because I wanted to go to the Arctic honestly <laughs> and I thought like okay Everyone. this is way too expensive so I'm gonna go and work there Everyone. but if you want to work at McMurdo which is the biggest one in the South Pole uh, then you have to be American national or jump through crazy hoops uh, to do it it's so really impossible british station also only british nationals and uh was really uh many many people who actually want to work there interestingly yeah um, i was just like okay i'm gonna cook or i can i can be work as an architect or whatever but it's never really necessary to need people who can fix the sink and uh, cook and stuff like that and yeah, it was really uh, interesting. Right, I think that's it, like uh, the closest we get to uh, Martian uh, simulation on Earth, Absolutely. I guess. Yeah. Just to call back to something in the chat, um, Liav, I'm probably pronouncing your name wrong, but um, you were saying about the little amount of fuel left. Um, you say not much fuel left. I say very, very good engineering margins. You know, the mass is so important in this. They absolutely have to. I think they're great. Um, yeah, it's, it's commonly said that um, Apollo 11 landed with 20 seconds of fuel remaining. Right, which isn't here. some people say oh my god that's so little fuel left and, and the engineers say great we nailed it exactly uh, our briefing remember another important point is Sorry. look at the we delta v equation the last seven. kilo of fuel is worth a lot uh, more than the first right, kilo we'll do an over -Volca report. Um, and i don't think anything yeah, else actually changes in this the um, also so something that uh, uh, yeah and apart, from the, apart from that number being wrong yeah so but the, the point being that people say there wasn't much fuel left um 
Um, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Copy. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to something that Cohen said about the Arctic base and all that. It's actually interesting to think about what's the threshold before more and more yeah, of the general population is willing to go to Mars. Uh, none, none that I care for us to so a, a rugged explorer first mission, very well probably a handful of people will be able to go. But a very large base with a city is even more comfortable than, let's say, Canada. <laughs> um, a lot of people probably, <laughs> and anyone would go. Canada in winter, you mean? Yeah. Uh, because so, Canada's pretty nice, actually. <laughs> exactly. And I'm thinking that each time, each effort made to make Mars more accessible unlocks a much larger portion of the population who becomes now ready and willing to go and their expertise. And also, if we're talking money, their income as well. Yeah. We talk about this a lot in Nexus Aurora, but about the, the threshold for this working, about sort of what's required in order to make it um, feasible. And there's actually two elements. You're, you're right about the the stuff about people wanting to go. I actually think people will want to go as long as there's like any kind of amenities on the surface or any anything to go to rather than just go to this barren wasteland. I think people will, will want to go very quickly. Um, what I talk about, my focus in, in within the community we have is more about industrial development, about the engineering behind it. And there's... A sort of runaway point you get to we talk about i talk about quite a lot um which is around the point where you start making materials on the surface to start building more habitats um broadly which is sort of when you when you can produce 80 90 percent of the mass of a new habitat structure completely with local resources um yeah i mean even today which is kind of more of a mass threshold than yeah yeah, 80, 90% yeah. of a regular building is dumb materials, bricks, exactly, floor, yeah. insulation. Those yeah. are things you can get through ISRU. Yeah, if you can get basalt fiber, steel, concrete, maybe some polymers through some clever chemistry. Um, if you can get that on the surface, then you sort of hit a runaway point and the cost drops so dramatically at that point that like... So, so I mean, on Earth, I, I guess one one yeah. more thing or element with, which would help a lot, I guess, is to have like a, an extreme power source that you can bring to Mars, uh, because you, in theory, at least uh, as we calculate, you can, um, if you have like an abundance of energy, a lot more options even for using uh, in situ re to resources uh, become available, um, yeah. and you can do like uh, energy. Uh, like things that are not efficient, uh, energy efficient, uh, you can still do because uh, the alternative is like uh, shipping it from Earth. So if you would, for example, use uh, water as uh, radiation protection instead of going way underground, uh, but you need to melt all of the glacier ice and all of that stuff, uh, yeah, that's going to take you a lot of, uh, well, energy, heat, and uh, all of that. So, But once you get a good quality nuclear reactor with a high capacity to Mars, then things can at least start to happen. And you yeah. can actually use the the Starship, uh, in this case, that I would guess would be used uh, itself, which is another 120 tons of uh, raw material, of course. Yeah. But if you think about the, the ISS is what? 400 um, odd, odd tons for yeah, a crew of seven, eight maximum. Um if you take that as your upper bound for how much you're going to need, that's a lot of mass, but a lot of that is dumb structure. It is, yeah, I think it is 420, actually, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of that is dumb structure. And if you can produce the steel that you need for it, then you can cut that number down to a fraction, maybe 20, maybe 10%. Um, and then you're kind of, that's kind of bingo, because then the price drops by pretty much the same factor. That's true. And um, interesting point about the energy source on Mars. Um, I'm, I'm of course, a big fan of nuclear technology. I post something about nuclear probably every other day <laughs> on Twitter. Um, and it is essential to start up a base because you don't have any backups, really. You're very mass limited. And if you want each kilo to count, a nuclear reactor gets you the most. Okay. Now, if you have a small base of like five people just trying to build something for other people to come and, you know, enter and inhabit 
if you're not going to accept a downtime of several weeks if the solar panels are unavailable. You want that maximum effort, minimum time and the possibility with nuclear reactors. However, in the long term, nuclear energy is not that great for Mars because the only real source of enriched uranium in the solar system, which you can get like cheaply, is Earth. Has been concentrated by the action of water over millions of years, not Mars. You can extract it on Mars, but it will be very, very expensive because of the amount of material you have to go through, refine, melt, and all that. But how heavy is uh, is the nuclear material itself? Well, you would ship it without energy, people. Yeah. I mean, Henry, uh, thorium, right, on Mars? Yeah, thorium, thorium reactor. Is I, I, is there not massive thorium de like thorium deposits on Mars significantly more so than Earth, or am I misremembering? Uh, I don't think there's more thorium on Mars. No, uh, from what I've seen, uh, the concentration is about two to ten parts per million. That's enough nuclear energy to melt the rock it came in, like ten to twenty, thirty megajoules per kilo. Okay. Wow. Yeah, uh, but that's the nuclear energy you find in all the planetary crusts. Uh, Mercury, like... Venus, Earth, and Mars all have roughly the same amount of uh, this uranium and thorium. However, on Earth, it has been concentrated and brought closer to the surface by the action of water because it dissolves uranium, which makes uh, some concentrations on Earth are like, I don't know, in the hundreds of ppm. You know, uranium mines. My issue is that if you really want exponential self-sustaining expansion on Mars, we're going to have to look at solar power. Once the scale is huge enough, like hundreds of meters of solar panel per person, in that case, your the balance between storage, energy production is enough to not need nuclear power, but nuclear power is needed for the startup. I, I don't think... Nuclear energy is, is sustainable in the long term because you will be forever dependent on regular shipping from Earth. I don't know, it's interesting. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of CANDU reactors, um, which is, it's a Canadian architecture of reactor. It's, um, what's it stand for? It works with unenriched uranium, uh, is the really big kicker. Um, unenriched by Earth standards. It's heavy, it's heavy water and unenriched uranium. Um, and it's been built by a few, there's a few Canadian ones, which are operational today, fully functional. Um, there hasn't been much development of them, mainly because you can't use them for enrichment with weapons grade stuff. So there's been, so during the Cold War, no one really cared about them because why would you bother reactors without bombs? Um, but potentially as a way of doing very low enrichment or very low processing power plants, it might be optional. Might be an option that you could you could go with, um, which is I find very interesting as a potential thing. Yes, so but and, also, and heavy yeah, and heavy water is actually abundant on Mars. Um, of course, yes, deuterium is a, which is the component of heavy water it replaces hydrogen is abundant throughout the solar system. In fact, it's so abundant we might never develop helium three fusion because deuterium fusion is just there's just so much more of it. So, guys, there's a question on the YouTube uh, live chat, uh, and that's by John Varley. And he asks, what do you think are the biggest potential findings from this mission? Well, life would be, would be quite a big one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's, that is the, the main one. And would, would you guys maybe say well, there are different targets, of course, and they are going to drill uh, core samples and they're going to send it back in about 10 years or so for future missions. That is very much uh, the goal. Is yeah. that all just basically searching for life or are there other things that are pe people are looking for as well? Well, this is much more of a d very careful astrobiology mission than the previous ones. Um, what they've talked about uh, in the progression of Mars Rivers was Spirit and Oppie were, follow were following the water and trying to find water on, trying to find water at all, or hydrated minerals or anything, um, which was successful. Curiosity was looking for the presence of the conditions for ancient life. It found them. And then Percy is looking very carefully for actual evidence of life remains, fossils, microfossils, whatever. 
doing great. Uh, ACS gave a great. It also uh, has some interesting things to demonstrate. Yes, that's the other thing. It's a massive technology demonstration know, mission. Presumably, ACS is now sitting in a new. Yeah, we didn't oh, even talk about Moxie. Oh, we didn't talk about yes. Moxie. Oh, Moxie. Why was oh. I talking about ISRU? I was moving to Moxie. <laughs> <laughs> Master of the segue. Should we talk about Moxie? Moxie. Um, uh, Martian oxygen something something something. Um, is an experiment about the size of a shoebox, which will try to produce from solid electro solid electrolysis cells oxygen from CO2, um, which is big. It is the, as far as I can tell, the first ever actual ISRU experiment carried out in situ. Um, that is correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's not very big. It's the size of a shoebox. It takes hundred watts. And it draw it. I think it's twenty grams an hour, if I remember correctly. Um, which is not very but much. Do, but do do they have like a mass spectrometer in that size? Yeah, it's it's going to analyze the. It's it's not analyze. It's analyzing that it's working correctly, basically. It's yeah, not, but but like uh, when I was in high school, at least I learned that a mass spectrometer is about the size of a classroom. But nowadays, it can fit in a freaking shoebox. That's crazy. I suspect it may be a maybe feeding into other systems, or they're just using a very single detector for oxygen rather than a full spectrum system. Hmm. Um, you can miniaturize sensors that are looking for one element only or yeah. one, one compound. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, if you're okay with that, uh, because that's a short and simple question by uh, Baker uh, R H J. Uh, when can we see or listen to the Mars sound? Well, you're not going to see it anyway, but. Uh, Sounds you can soon. listen to, of course, but uh, probably soon. What is soon? What is soon? <laughs> soon, Henry, next maybe few, next few weeks, I assume, unless you know different, Henry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would probably say a little earlier than that, maybe like three days. That would be great. But in three days, yeah, we're gonna. The Curiosity rover got its video back in a few days, but that was lower quality. That was um, ten frames a second. It wasn't HD video, and it didn't have audio. So maybe it takes mm -hmm. a little bit longer to come back but I, I would be very surprised if we didn't have it within like a week so can i just ask one maybe question myself like if you're launching something to mars right now um is it isn't it possible to separate uh, a small um what do you call those uh, micro sets uh, cube set sorry uh, or a couple of them um or is the uh, orbit uh, not in the right orientation so is it possible to 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 launch cubesats in the same mission as you launch a rover for instance or is that impossible it's that's, a very that's interesting exactly question. what insight did um, it's a very interesting question though about um about orbiting um and i think i don't know if it's zubrin that's talked about this before where he reckons it'll be easier to get to the martian surface with large scale missions um, than orbit, because at least in terms of human missions, I don't think this is the case with. Um, but but Henry, what did you say that it has already been done? Uh, well, kind of. Um, Insight's uh, rover or Insight is a lander on a rover, but Insight deployed two cubesats that it used to get uh, telemetry. Yeah, uh, I forget what they were called. Um, but yeah, if you look up Insight lander cubesats, they launched two. Uh, and they both, I think, went into a heliocentric orbit. Yep, uh, Mars Cube 1. Yeah, it had a Mars Cube 1A and Mars Cube 1B. Um, yeah. And I think they, they were only like a communications link. They they didn't really bother with anything else. But, but then they would sort of skip off board. the... Uh, they would skip off the atmosphere, kind of? Is that the idea? Uh, yeah, I guess you... so. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe, they'd, maybe they'd, they'd have been released before... It corrected to get into orbit. Yeah, but but even then, uh, then it will be an extreme heliocentric orbit. Then, yeah, I guess because it's going like that, ten thousand, like sixteen hundred, sixteen thousand kilometers an hour, right? Something. Um, like that. Well, if if it's if those little cubesats are put on a little adjusted trajectory, which they fly by close to Mars, Mars would accelerate them into a more round orbit, which stays close to Mars for most of the year. Yeah, you could you could do that. Yeah, it's like like a gravity assist basically. But uh, from an energy perspective, 
uh, breaking into orbit using a rocket is much, much more expensive than just hitting the atmosphere and using air brake. Yeah, because I actually understood if you want to go anywhere near normal, uh, let's say, uh, comparable to Earth, uh, normal orbits uh, at a normal distance also from the surface, uh, with without extreme latency uh, in case you would want to use it as a GPS or whatever, you would almost certainly need uh, the atmosphere to um, uh, remove uh, most of your uh, speed, actually. That's how I understood it, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, technically, we have never used an atmosphere to slow down into an orbit, which is called aero capture. We've done an aero braking onto the surface, a, a full re-entry. We've done uh, a capture using rockets, but never a combination of heat shields, passage through the atmosphere for braking, then you exit back into space and use rockets to circularize or enter an orbit which doesn't go into the atmosphere again. We've never tried that. But if you go through like NASA papers, there's like hundreds of missions which look at the huge benefits from aero capture and say, you know, all these amazing things we can do. Yeah. Well, there's still lots more to do <laughs> in space. So another question from Baker again is, did you have signals from the Martian meteorites about the amino acids? Um, I, I believe there was one there's a Martian microfo meteorite which had one. Yeah, it had the maybe microfossils. The maybe microfossils? Question yeah. mark. <laughs> and that's it. And even then, there was more and more data saying those were not living organisms or traces of them. So in general, Mars has nothing living on it, as far as we know. And we hope to find the contrary. But as far as we know, there's nothing living on it. And there's even less chance of anything from there, fossil or not, reaching back to us. Yeah, and I don't, I'd be surprised if amino acids could um, function, could survive a meteorite impact anyway. They're fairly volatile. Um, you, you would be surprised about uh, what can survive a, a re entry. You know? <laughs> Remember, a, a, a meteorite slamming into the atmosphere, the re entry is very short, like seconds. Yeah, not true. The, true. Even this one, which uh, entered at five kilometers per second, it was what? Two, three minutes of hard deacceleration. And that's a like, like 11 G, right? So a meteorite yeah. might have hundreds of Gs in that case. Thousands. thousands in some even, meteorites, yeah. they survive so much G-forces that the sheer compression makes them explode mm. Um, mm. in the atmosphere before hitting the ground. So yeah, I but, think a, a lot of things can survive, even delicate molecules, a re -entry. So, so, so uh yeah so they they could survive uh, even with life on them uh, that that's that or potentially nah that that might be too far-fetched uh, maybe but at least the, the building life, blocks for life the life would have to be some sort of um inactive life like uh, a virus yeah. capsule or yeah. a tardigrade hibernating dehydrated some sort of thing which yeah, or, or former piece of life that you could still find within the meteorite or whatever. But it's really, yeah. But uh, yeah. what what I'm just thinking about, if we saw, like, you guys said that was about, like, uh, 11 Gs or so that uh, Perseverance, uh, okay, yeah, I see Henry nodding. So, um, but if we would go with Starship, um, you would have to do a completely different trajectory, likely, and maybe get like uh, 20 minutes of aero braking or so, I guess. What, do you have any idea? Can you tell us, Henry? Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, 11 Gs, uh, even for a relatively brief amount of time, would not be great for humans. Um, what's the limit on what? I think on your back, you can handle like 4 Gs pretty well, I think. Yeah, uh, you can do it for a very short talking. time, 8 or 9 Gs, but that's like fighter pilots, uh, jet yeah. suits, and uh, like a stringed in uh, leg, uh, all of these compression yeah. suits. So yeah, let's just say 5 are... Gs at max. Although Imagine uh, you go yeah. from 0 G for 7 months to, <laughs> you know, like 15 Gs. I, I would, that would... A lot of vomiting. Um, no, but uh, on Nexus Aurora, we're working, uh, we're probably going to be working on... Um, 
on a, a gravity uh, artificial gravity wheel uh, yes, inside so starship so uh we'll uh we might not have that problem but uh who knows yeah um, if you recall during the re-entry of the perseverance rover just before the deployment of the parachute the speed was dropping but the altitude was around the seven mile mark pretty flat it was using the lift of its angled heat shield to continue breaking high up in the atmosphere without yes, dropping. Indeed, lifting body re-entries. Um, exactly. So it was using that. It was yeah. pretty clear when the you know the, the altitude was still dropping but flattened out while the speed was going like four hundred miles an hour or something. And Starship will do that same thing, but like with two, three times better lift to drag ratio. Minimum. So it would have that flattened trajectory much higher up. Would you agree? Yeah, it should. I'm going to just uh, respond to a question in the, a fun question in the, in the, that came in the chat about the Martian, um, the film, and saying how realistic it was. And I can say that the book of the Martian is remarkably well done. Um, it's pretty much, I know that the guy who wrote it built his own directory simulator to actually work out all the timing, all the dates correctly. Um, there is one mistake in the book which you can't blame him for because it wasn't discovered till after it was published. And that is perchlorates in the soil. He did it. That wasn't known about when it was written. Um, it was It was just like, it wasn't a known factor. So the scenes in which uh, Watney gets soil in from the outside, uh, he would get thyroid cancer basically immediately from doing that. Um, which, like, it's so annoying because it's so close to being yeah, but really... he, he yeah. but he might have gotten home. He would just have gone. He might have gotten then. home if he if he'd worn a, <laughs> if he'd worn a dust mask. He might have been alright from it, um, or gloves or something like that. But um, apart from that one detail, it's really really well done. No one bio duct tape. It's doable. I've done I've done comparable things in the past. Um, well, the one the one big mistake in the the movie is the whole atmosphere of pressure the, the first scene in the movie yes where they need to get yeah, the science fiction them. element yeah yeah and i think andy weir said something like yeah i just couldn't think of a reason why they would have to like yeah. just kind of made something up um well but it's a great movie i mean apart from really those good. those couple mistakes i think it's very accurate i, th- yeah, I think the, if uh, you if you can create a movie that uh, a general audience likes about Mars, you did a good job uh, because yeah. I've tried to watch almost all Mars movies, and most of them are so bad. It's really, really bad. <laughs> one, I actually, the one that I like most, which is not really about Mars, is what's the name? I think uh, Europa or something. That uh, at the very end of the movie that they find life or whatever, something like that. I don't even know that's what the like name is. Horror called. movie or something. No, but that's that's a really good one, and it's really low budget and really unknown. I'm gonna post it in the chat. It's really good. I'm gonna find it in a few minutes. I, I yeah. like um, Mars the series from National Geographic. I quite like that one. Yeah, but yeah. the focus is different. They they need to get it right because that's you know what they're telling right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a question about, for you like, then. About Speaking about the Martian. Yeah. How would you deal with perchlorates in the soil in a um <laughs> I'm so I'm so glad you asked me that. Get let me <laughs> let me get my sprit and my flow charts. Um you can wash it out, is the answer. It's water soluble. Um so you can just if you run water through Martian soil, it'll come out. Um if you heat it under pressure, it will uh, decompose into chlorine and oxygen. Uh, and halogen salts, all of which are fine. Um, as you say, using acids also dissolve it, but you have to make the acids in situ. Um, basically, if you have water and you have a fairly simple process plant, you can purify soil. Um, it may what happens possible... to that water afterwards? It will be well, so, so, so then you you have. I mean, you want to do that anyway because Martian soil is super salty, um, both in the point of view like like actual like sodium chloride salt but also a whole lot of other really bad salts for growing plants in, or so on. Um, mm. So you want to do this sort of wash anyway, and at that point uh, it gets fun, because you can either just heat it. If you just heat it under pressure, um, it will um, break... A lot, of those complex, a lot of the complex salts will break down into their simpler parts, um, perchlorates into chlorine, chloride, oxygen, um, that kind of thing. 
or you just evaporate the water off in a, in a controlled volume, uh, get the water out of the pump, just lower the pressure, it'll boil off. And then you have this really good salt mixture. Um, and one of our members is actually, uh, Orion Lawler, look up on YouTube, he's great, has worked out that you can, in fact, take those perchlorates and turn it into a viable blasting explosive for mining on Mars, which is just the coolest thing because it's right. taking something that is traditionally absolute chemical waste um, that you really want to dispose so, yes. of. And, I mean, it's not it's, it's not the best explosive. You have to... It needs to be mixed with... Um, it's like... Anfo, it's, it's, if you think about um, ANFO, ammonium nitrate fuel oil, um, instead of ammonium nitrate, you have sodium perchlorate, also pretty explosive. Uh, and instead of fuel oil, which is uh, uh, from crude oil, you use um, anaerobically decomposed biomatter. So you take your... The, the drudge out of your out of your compost heap or your sewage system or whatever, you heat it and pressurize it till it goes into this horrible black sludge, um, which is just this horrible organic mix. You can't get anything useful out of it. Um, it's not a poop bomb because it's been it's been so far decomposed. It's just carbon at that point. Um, and you mix your carbon and your perchlorate, and you have a decent explosive. And this guy, I'll find a link to his YouTube channel because it's great. And I suppose and, it doesn't need an oxidizer. It's, it's... No, the perchlorate is the oxidizer. Um, he's managed to actually crack rocks open with this, um, which, um, is all, which is awesome. Okay, there's explosives, but now I'm thinking of another use, which is energy. Potentially, yeah. It decomposes. Um, I suppose it releases heat. In that case, you've got a sort of, you know, chemical one-time use energy source. Perhaps, yeah, or even oxygen generators, potentially. If you need an emergency oxygen generator, currently we use um. We use peroxides, that kind of thing, or, or metal oxides. If you can decompose perchlorate using an oxygen generator, I don't know if that's plausible or not, but it could be. Yeah, but I'm also thinking now, in terms of practicality, uh, you would really not want anything explosive near a Mars base, especially the first types of Mars bases, which are just bubbles on the surface. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we, we talked about, about the protocols you need to have for actually mixing explosive on Mars. Um, it'd be pretty crazy. Um, but it, it's possible. Once you get to the point of having to actually do like subsurface mining or quarrying, like it's better than shipping it via rocket. because Pretty much anything is better than shipping it via rocket. Well, not just in terms of mass terms. In terms of um, being allowed to launch 10 tons of high explosive on top of a rocket, I have a <laughs> feeling that might not be entirely... Viewed favorably, uh, you can get around regulations by having a solid rocket motor stage, which you don't use. That's you just land the solid rocket motor, call it a motor until it arrives on the surface. Yeah, um, yeah, or, or I think okay, perhaps a bit more practical on Mars if you have an ISRU operation going on producing rocket fuel, I'm just going to use a liquid explosive, make some fuel, make some liquid oxygen, and go. Oh, isn't using it as rocket fuel, perhaps? If you're producing, let's say, liquid methane and liquid oxygen and yeah. large quantities of both, they will be probably the most practical way to demolish something or break something open. Or oh, open. yeah. Um, yeah, liquid state explosives, we looked at it as a, as a concept. Um, yeah. And they're well, hard to ignite on their own, unlike some self-contained, self-oxidizing. Yeah, there's there's some research done on this. Um, it's quite hard because you end up with it. It wants to blow itself apart. Obviously, you end up you have this inner layer. It wants to sort of shred itself. Um, the most practical ways have been devised to do this is you have these multiple shells of liquid of alternating liquids. Um, okay. So you have a sphere full of methane, then a sphere full, then outside that a shell with oxygen in it, and then methane, oxygen, methane, oxygen. So it doesn't just shred, like otherwise the interface between the two would cause a massive expand, amount of expanding gas that would just push them apart. Um, and by having shells, you can make it happen much better. That's interesting. Well, you understand I don't go looking around for how to build liquid explosives, so I don't know yeah. any of this. <laughs> yes, oh, I'm sure I'm on many, many watch lists for, for the stuff I've Googled in the interest of Mars. Yeah. Okay, so that's really interesting. Uh, and this all derived from our questions on Moxie. So, yes. Um, have you heard of a concept um, which is to minimize the actual ISRU requirements on Mars, and it's called bring your own hydrogen? 
Yeah, this is what Zubrin likes, isn't it? Zubrin wants idea. it done quick and dirty, which is produce oxygen, which is 88% of the fuel load of a hydrogen oxygen rocket leaving Mars. And then the hard part to manufacture, which is actually the hydrogen, you just bring it along with you. I think in, in practice, what you what you will likely see is that um, Elon or SpaceX will make so many rockets that um, there will be some form of fuel even sent to Mars surface itself. Yeah. If well, if they don't make it in the first few uh, uh, landing attempts uh, and they, they can't find a way to actually um, create uh, la- large quantities of this fuel, they will send extra ships with fuel, only fuel. They have to, mm. uh, because they want those people to get to be able to get back. Yeah, it makes sense if to set up an ISRU operation on Mars. The way we're looking at doing it right now is deploying these hundreds of square meters of solar panels and a crew of dozens of people just to maintain them. Uh, if we don't get permission for a nuclear reactor uh, and quickly, it's it's going to be you know, fuel deliveries from Earth get by. Yeah, it's it's, it's actually going to be uh, thousands of square meters of solar panel, and I'm going to guess well, each launch. The start, well, so this ties into nicely, because our measures are about Sabatier reactors. Mm. So um, a Sabatier reactor is a way of starting. It's a multi-step process. You start with, you input hydrogen and carbon dioxide, I want to say. Um, and maybe oxygen, or you input CO2 and water. And it's well, a multi-step yeah. reactor yeah. that outputs methane and oxygen in the right ratio to be burnt in, a, in an engine, um, which is obviously hugely valuable because what Mars has lots of is CO2, and what Mars has lots of that's hard to get to is water. So the idea is that rather than having to bring about a 1,000 tons of fuel for your Starship to launch, or whatever other engine, um, I think the Hercules uh, is another lander that's been developed as well by NASA, or is on the drawing board. Um, for your methane oxygen lander, you don't have to bring any carbon or oxygen at all. The question yes. is, do you need to bring what hydrogen or not? And what Zubrin says is, the amount of effort to autonomously extract water, either from the atmosphere or the ground, is so great that it's almost certainly worth bringing hydrogen instead and feeding that directly into a reactor rather than trying to manufacture it in situ. And yes, I kind of agree yes. with him. It's like atmospheric, we've seen from, like they talked on Moxie a lot about, from the Moxie mission about the long-term extendability. And they reckon something the size of a chest freezer would be enough to provide a crew with oxygen um, going forward. So really not really big at all. Um, I don't remember the power consumption. It's a few kilowatts, I think, maybe a tens of kilowatts. Mm-hmm. So you're talking a few tens of kilowatts um, and basically just some big fans to get the carbon and the oxygen. But the hydrogen requires like surveying the site in incredible detail and then mining and then processing. And then you have to actually move material around, which requires hauling trucks. They're going to break down inevitably because everything in a mine gets covered in dust and grit and gets corroded like hell. You then have to melt it then purify it, then purify it again to make sure it's the right purity, and then feed it into your actual Sabatier reactor. And also potentially electrolyze it along the way, which is even more power. Well, well if you need to split up the hydrogen, you're going to need to give like 140 megajoules for each kilo. Exactly. It's tremendously power intensive. Um, or um, I, but, there is a way around those constraints, which is literally to land on one of the frozen poles and dig below the frozen CO2 layer to get huge masses of frozen ice. But that's like, you know, you're giving up one constraint for another. Yeah, the yeah, polar regions up, are... Up solar. Uh, yeah, polar regions are quite quite a poor choice, so somewhere to go. Well, we might be talking about this in the future, Henry, if we want, do we want to announce this now. <laughs> uh, keep, keep, <laughs> keep eyes peeled. We are discussing in Exodus War about having a mini conference about about martian site selection about how it works um so watch this space and potentially watch our, our social media feeds um and i can give you one tip um, um i've been in contact with this guy martian colonist who has his own youtube channel 
you might have seen him. He's the bold guy from the UK as well, uh, Sam, with the glasses. A nice guy. He works in, uh, yeah. some, I don't know, in the US. But uh, I'll send you his contact info because he had a really nice talk uh, that you can look up on YouTube um, with a, a specialist who really uh, works for, I guess, NASA in uh, doing the site selection uh, on Mars. Uh, specifically, and that was a really great talk. And uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll send you the detailed uh, info in a second. Yeah, there's a lot of people thinking about these problems and they'll come up with different solutions. And it's up to basically the space industry to make them possible. Because right now, none of this is possible. Uh, there are no payloads. Oh, no, for great. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, um, um Sorry? Yeah. Sorry, your sound cut out for yeah. a bit. Or is it me? I'm not sure. No, I think it was Sam's sound. Yeah. All right. And um, yeah, I mean, I, from my perspective, I'm always looking at the, yeah. the larger variety of options rather than what's constrained by price or politics yeah. right now. And yeah. one of the interesting solutions is Phobos, as in, you do all the this. The interesting question is, for example, oh, it looks like Sam is He's getting some bit. internet troubles. Would it be worthwhile, perhaps, if you really want to be sure it's going to work, right? Maybe you should. Oh, sorry, Sam. Sorry. Uh, your words are coming down slowed by about three, four times. <laughs> Um, all right, so I just finished that thought. Um, there is an idea where you do all the hard ISRU work from a base on Phobos in orbit, permanent sunlight, and uh, it does not cost a lot of resources or energy to drop down a load of fuel onto the surface compared to how much you could potentially save by making it in orbit. So the idea is that Phobos could be loaded with lots of ices below the surface, they're much easier to extract and in a much smaller volume than, you know, spread over Martian surface. Uh, there are a lot less constraints in terms of uh, digging through, you know, there's no dust storms. The radiation shielding is literally just a hole in the ground and you're protected from all corners. Uh, Phobos has a lot of practicality and a lot of the fuel you're going to use anyway is the exit from Mars. That's what you need the most fuel for. Not lifting off from Mars, but exiting from Mars. And if you provide that fuel in orbit, you could both use a smaller spaceship and, you know, get that fuel load more easily. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's another idea. A giant, basically captured asteroid, we think, which became the Martian moon Phobos and then we turn it into a fuel station in orbit. Another question from YouTube is, um, thanks for answering all the questions so far. How do they display the solar energy? Must be massive delta between hot and cold. What materials do they use? Well, oh, sorry, go solar ahead. panels work better when they're cold. Uh, we have tested regular silicon panels, I mean, with some treatment, working at cryogenic temperatures just to test how much better their efficiency gets. So in terms of technology, we have the technology to make solar panels which work at very cold temperatures. At very hot temperatures, well, how hot does it get on Mars? Like, what's the peak temperature on Mars? It's less than a hot day on Earth, right? It's about the same as a hot day on Earth. Uh, like at the equator on like a hot summer day, I'm gonna, I can only think in Fahrenheit right now, like 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah. So as long as you engineer the solar panel to survive the thermal expansion differences, it will work. But I, I don't know if any particular studies on this. So uh, oh, Sam's mic is uh, completely off uh, right now. I'm actually 
is it maybe an interesting idea since we are now really like in an open flow discussion to um, let people actually ask a question by voice if they want? Is that okay with you guys? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I enabled yeah. it. Yeah. So everyone yeah. can now unmute themselves. Uh, I'm finally back. <laughs> Okay, so Sam, uh, you go ahead. I'll try and manage the questions. Uh, so if yeah. you have a question, uh, please uh, yeah, uh, uh, say that you want to ask a question in the chat and I'll, I'll give you the, the, the word and you can, uh, you can open the mic then, okay? Yeah. But Sam, go ahead first. Uh, yeah, Malik, I was going to say I agree with you hugely about um, Phobos. It's, it's a real potential that I think is being overlooked right now. Um, we have actually the Martian Moons Explorer uh, is a mission yes. from, ja Very from JAXA. Very excited about. You, did you talk about that? Sorry, I might have missed that. Uh, um, no, I didn't mention that specific mission. But there is a slight uh, worry that Phobos is drier than we initially expected, which might dampen our plans to use it as a sort of orbital fuel station. Yeah. We can't know for sure until a mission like Mars Mars uh, Orbiter arrives. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for that. And it, it's actually sort of in a race with um, the the surface mission stack because. Um, it's trying to it's trying to return a sample from Phobos is the goal. Um, it seems to be broadly similar to the to higher booster in the way it works um, as a kind of asteroid orbiter and then sample return mission. Um, so we might see that potentially in the next. I think it's launching in twenty twenty four. If I'm if I'm correct, hopefully it won't fail like Phobos Grunt failed. Um, <laughs> uh, Grant Hartley says it's a, there's a Phobos curse makes these missions fail i've heard about i mean i've heard from people about a martian curse from the, the um the engineers behind beagle so it might just be that whoever's mission failed last declares there's a curse <laughs> um right so um whoever has a mic can ask questions in an orderly fashion of course yeah hi guys um thanks Hello. for having this uh chat yeah. Um, I, I asked the question in chat earlier. I, I don't think you got to it regarding the um, a moon versus Mars debate. Um, I've seen the uh, Zubrin talk, um, kind of talking about um, making the case that we should go to the moon before we go to Mars and discussing several options for that. Uh, and I'm wondering what your thoughts on that, on that are, uh, whether that's a, a better first target uh, or should we go straight for Mars? Um, I'll give a sh my short thoughts on this. It's not a technical question and it won't give you a technical answer. You can compare the Delta V costs for getting fuel from the moon or from Mars. You can compare the risks of putting a base three days away from Earth or three months away from Earth at best. These are all technical answers, but the real you know, crux of the problem is what's the public opinion regarding a mission to Mars? Will NASA get a big boost if it finally puts a person on the red surface versus returning to the moon, which is done before? Uh, so it, it, the answer depends on what the person you're asking believes is important in space exploration. But what do you think, uh, Malik, yourself? Oh, me, I'm, I'm for the moon approach, the step-by-step -step approach first. Uh, you might know Jeff Greeson from x uh, He also is an advocate for the step-by-step -step approach. And the idea is that we can't trust the technology right now, which you know keeps humans surviving in space. The ISS, yes, it's worked for 20 years and is breaking down already. Uh, would you risk humans on that same platform far away from any help? Well, yeah. Let me respond as well. Um, I feel that um, if you look at SpaceX, uh, for instance, and I compare it to Tesla a little bit as well. Um, so, so Musk says, for example, yeah, uh, I want to create a twenty-five thousand dollar car, and he's saying that now for how old is Tesla? Fifteen years, or I don't know, uh, twelve, fifteen years. Um, and it's the same with Mars. Um, I think he doesn't really have that much of a problem going to the moon, but he's never going to say that publicly because he's talking about the big vision, the dot uh, at the horizon, right? Um, so that's at least the way I feel about it as well. Uh, you should just keep uh, Mars as your main objective. Don't be distracted by the moon. 
use the moon as a stepping stone still uh, because NASA is paying you for it now as well. You're going to learn a lot. A lot of technologies needs to be uh, need to be developed as well, uh, which we are working on in Nexus Aurora as well. Everything that SpaceX doesn't do is what we are trying to solve to make uh, uh, a settlement uh, permanent uh, for humans uh, outside of Earth, uh, if at all possible. Um, so I, I personally would say uh, go for Mars and... Um, if you need to use the moon as a sidestep uh, to get there, that's fine. Uh, but your vision and your main target should remain Mars. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Yeah, that's I, I a would, good point. Yeah, I'd add one thing to that. Um, thinking on the on the longer term, on the on the hundred year timeline, which is that I I think that Mars is a more compelling target for first colony. I think it's got a lot of benefits as a as a colonization location. The moon doesn't um, in terms mostly in terms of resource availability. It's much easier to get the, the resources on Mars are much more um, stratified and clustered than on the Moon, and solar power is easier compared to the, the long night and so on. Um, but at the same time, if you could really crack hydrogen and oxygen on the Moon and get it cheap and get it available in orbit, that changes everything about solar system exploration because that gets you away from the thing of having to launch five or six vehicles for every vehicle to the outer solar system. Um, and you can start doing the really fun expanse style um, <laughs> long distance ships running big hydrodox engines. And that's that's where we want to aim for. That's true, that's true. But I think all of these discussions are also colored by the fact for the past 50 years, basically, we've had trouble getting to that next step. I okay, have these grand projects, the space shuttle is supposed to set up this cislunar transport system. We have the ISS supposed to be the first of many space stations. We have the Apollo mission supposed to be, you know, the, the pathfinder for a moon base. Or every time we've had these plans for a, a small initial effort, which would lay the groundwork for a grander later effort, that later effort never realized. Yeah, that's and, very true. Uh, it makes people scared to not put all their eggs in one basket and actually go and push for that grander mission from, you know, from the get-go. So, yeah, that's so, Henry, uh, could you also answer the question? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I think Mars is definitely a lot more compelling than the moon in terms of, like, the 100-year time scale, your first colony. There's very few geologic mechanisms that occur on Earth that form minerals that don't also happen on Mars, um, at least for the key minerals. So there's a tremendous amount of mineral diversity on Mars, whereas the moon is really just like the crust of the Earth that has been sheared off by an impact and then coalesced into this object. It's very uniform. Uh, there's not a lot of interesting minerals going on. And, um, well, in order to become a self-sufficient city, you need mining. You need a lot of mining um, for a very diverse range of minerals. And that's just not going to happen on the moon. That being said, if, it's, if we can create hydrogen and oxygen and, you know, Shackleton Crater and use that as a base to go further into the solar system, then it's awesome. Uh, I mean, ideally, I'd say both. Why not? Um, an interesting outcome from that, from what you just said, is that if you can survive on Mars, you can survive on Mars. But if you manage to survive on the Moon, you have the technology and methods for surviving basically anywhere in the solar system. Um, I true. see uh, Paito has a question. He wants to un unmute his mic or something. Hello, Henry. Hello, Next Astro. Astro, how are you? Hello. Uh, Yes, I have a question. Um, you know how the moon affects uh, the, the ocean tide when it's uh, orbiting around the Earth? I don't know what that, uh, what scientific term that has. Okay, so uh, my question is, um, does uh, the moon also have that same effect with the atmosphere, the Earth atmosphere? And does that... Uh, affect the planning uh, for NASA to launch uh, 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 to, to launch uh, outside space 
considering that maybe the, the atmosphere gets thicker when the moon is at a certain angle uh, next to the, the Earth. Uh, so that's my question. Thank you. I bet it would. I've never thought about that before. Yeah, there definitely is atmosphere tides. And you can calculate the atmosphere tides. Yeah, I did this in one of my like atmospheric physics classes. Um, but the total but, effect is very small. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. quite small. And I don't think it would affect it like in a meaningful way the height of the atmosphere enough to change like mission planning as an example yeah um, i mean it, it might we, actually uh change a bit of weather patterns and stuff like that i could assume something I, like that together with the coriolis effect and stuff like that but um i don't think that uh, there will be launches uh, launched at a different time frame because of uh, too thick an atmosphere for instance i it's actually interesting if you look at air pressure in general, which would probably be a bigger uh, change in atmospheric pressure. Uh, if if uh, what percentage of um, uh, extra uh, rocket uh, power you could get out of your engines uh, once you are in a very low pressure zone and then launch, I guess that would, <laughs> that would help maybe a little bit more even. I mean, you're talking a percent either way. I think that's probably not quite worth it. <laughs> well, uh, a percent uh, is like uh, uh, in in rockets. It's always about like you have if 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 uh, Earth gravity would be three or four percent more, um, just about any rocket would not be able to lift off. Right? That's that's the yeah, main that's 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 issue. No, no I, I, that's that's not true. I imagine the effect would be fairly minimal, just because the f that you, it's an effect on the first stage only, and on the fairly low part of the first stage. So, and that's sort of the least valuable i guess it's quite it's kind of hard to describe without looking at the equation it's at least at least like valuable part of it but uh, malik uh, knows the actual equation uh, i don't remember but uh, i thought it was like so, uh, about five percent or so if it would be more gravity five percent then you would have a big problem getting off earth if you look at the uh, the uh the orbital velocity equation you will see that it varies with the square root of the mass of the object you're orbiting. So if you increase the the, the mass of the object you're orbiting, I see the, the Earth's mass increases by 5%, which means its gravity increases by 5%. The effect on your total delta V is 2.47%. And so your delta V that the rocket has to deliver increases by 2.4%. Now, of course, it is an exponential increase in the amount of mass you need to deliver. But if you tell me a rocket which has to deliver 9,300 meters per second to get into orbit now has to deliver 9,500 meters per second, I will not call this impossible. Yeah, that seems so, so very yeah. logical. Yeah. Do, do the maths on common sayings and you will find some interesting truths. Yeah, interesting. Um, thanks. And thanks for the question, uh, by the way. It's a really interesting way to even think <laughs> about uh, the moon uh, uh, influencing our atmosphere. Uh, if anyone else uh, wants to ask a question, feel free to do so. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Uh, great, thank you. So, so I'm interested in the idea of how, you know, we said earlier, one of the really interesting findings might be if if there were some signs of life or, or, or previous life on Mars, or indeed in, in any of the exploration that we've spoken about, how what, what are your thoughts about how that might really change the missions? So I've seen some projected timelines for when there could be manned missions to Mars. And, you know, if Perseverance did find old cells or bacteria, I'm not expert enough to know really what they might find at all. I'm, of course, a lay person, but how might that change planning and, you know, what sort of effect might that have on whether we would send people there? Oh, I think well, it would, it would yeah. be massive if we, if we found unambiguous evidence of life, even past life, would be, would be I think, massive. Well, I, I think two two things uh, would be my short answer. One is life on Earth would change quite dramatically, 
especially some religions, I guess, uh, <laughs> which uh, would need to fact check a lot of the the thing they wrote in in their books. Um, and it's it, it would be like another moment, like uh, uh, the Earth is not the center of the galaxy anymore, as we always thought in the past, right? So Galileo uh, kind of moment. Uh, would happen in terms of religion uh, and also our place as humans and finding out this is like the next next big stepping stone in human development, I would say. It's one of the biggest discoveries ever. I would say it's comparable to like, uh, if, if you look uh, thousands of years in the future and we're still around as humanity, it's going to be like a defining moment, like uh, yeah. AI and uh, the internet and think mm-hmm. of all of that kinds of extreme important discoveries uh... I, I mean like the other thing is from the from the point of view of like Fermi paradox things and and great filterism um it's really fascinating implications because like i, I i've heard stuff that like if we, if we found life microbial life or even fossil life on mars that's amazing news because it means that life is incredibly abundant in the universe like two out of two <laughs> <laughs> like that, that that's starting to become a trend at that point um right so if, if you, like currently we have we have one one how one planet that's that's ever been habitable that we know of um and it's got life on it so that's not the best data set and we go to another one that was habitable broadly for a different period of time different conditions and that got life as well like what does that say about exoplanets for example um i think it's it's remarkably it is it, such a change. On the other hand, if we find life that was more advanced than us, that's terrifying. Because I don't know if you guys are aware of the idea of the Great Filter, um, no. and the idea that um, the answer to the Fermi paradox is that there is some Great Filter which kills off the vast majority of life somewhere on the chain. Um, whether that's uh, at the formation, like like at the stage of um, the oxygen crisis. So most, when life evolves oxygenation, when on photosynthesis, most life dies out at that point, or at the multicellular stage, or whatever. Or maybe it's global warming, maybe it's nuclear war. So if we find something that's more advanced than us, and then died out, that's not looking great for humanity, the, the fact that another one evolved and then didn't, and then was killed off by something. So it's, yeah, it's a so very there would be a huge cultural impact, like Doan said. Uh, there will be uh, great implications for life outside the solar system, as Sam says. But also thinking in practical terms, there will be two responses. The first is to protect the life. Uh, if if it was only uh, localized, uh, we'd have to you know, put into place extreme measures to make sure we do not disrupt any further discoveries around that life. But on the other hand, there will be huge public support for a large likely human crewed missions to go to Mars as soon as possible, dig up, put a geologist on the surface, dig up some samples and, you know, find answers you know, quickly. <laughs> you know, Malik, it, it could actually, when I was thinking about my answer just now, I, I, I thought that maybe the exact opposite could also be the response because you want to preserve life in that sense. You yes. don't want to be able to spoil it with human presence as a potential life contaminant, sort of. So it could actually slow down human Mars exploration and uh, ask, for example, just to send send uh, robotics uh, there. Yeah. Could well, actually, uh, or, or perhaps there's always the option of a hybrid mission. But sorry, sorry, I spoke over you. Um, or perhaps, perhaps you're worried about contamination backwards. Um, could then be a very real fear that people have, even if it's not really not really founded. Well, that would be easy. Never send anything back. Samples, <laughs> robots. Yeah, but humans uh, <laughs> might be difficult <laughs> to uh, not send back. Uh, but you know, when uh, when the moon missions happened, I don't know if you have seen these uh, movies about these extreme fears when the people came back and uh, decontamination, and they thought like <laughs> uh, all the things that could go wrong, and uh, yeah. People will be scared for these reasons as well. But I'm, I'm actually, for me, it's like a 50-50 if I would need to say, like, uh, look into the future, what would be the result, except for the cultural stuff on Earth, indeed. It could uh, uh, ex- mean an extreme boom in Martian exploration with humans as well. 
and all uh, countries in the world uh, really wanting to be the first to get people there and to really take a look at uh, what's what's going on there, uh, even if it's past life. Um, but on the other hand, it could be the exact opposite. And like uh, people, let's not go there. We just in the first coming decades, we're just going to send rovers, no people. Could be either of those, actually. Um, but like I said, there's a hybrid solution, which is to send rovers on the surface, but they are tilly operated and serviced by a human space station in orbit around Mars. Absolutely. Now, yeah. humans get on the surface, but you'll have the near direct communication with them from orbit. Like yes. Remotely controlled Big from, fan of that. you know. I, I actually went back in back in the day in Nexus Raw when we were planning out the mission architecture. I wrote a plan up where I think you have two hole transfer windows where no one goes on the surface, but you have manned space stations around Mars just doing teleoperation for construction. I I think it's a great idea because it meshes well with the concept of extracting rocket fuel from Phobos. Yeah, and it means potentially you can. You have less of a jump between ISS tech and and this tech, That's true. or yes. Lunar Gateway, perhaps. But you fascinating. Know, Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I feel somewhat embarrassed for not discounting the cultural side, uh, and not, I was so engaged in the conversation. It's really those practical sides. So that's really, really interesting to hear. And you know, w w we shall see over the coming months. Uh, yeah, actually... years and decades, maybe even. Yeah, yeah. It will take some time uh, before we get the samples back as well. Yeah, um, Dave, just before you go, um, I've actually had this conversation with many people, uh, especially people who are, let's say, less knowledgeable about the technical stuff. Let's not forget that all of space exploration at its root is motivated by cultural reasons, human curiosity for what's out there and what that means for our past and our future. And that means there's plenty, plenty aspects of, you know, space exploration, which have nothing to do with rocket engineering or science, science yeah. communication, uh, fundraising, politics, uh, all these are critical to the space exploration effort and accessible to anyone who, you know, is just motivated to get people excited for space, you know? Yeah. Well, that can be done outside of engineering. I, I was worried to raise the politics word because so much of this banks on that international, uh, if not cooperation, competition. But with some of the politics now, I, I wondered if you guys would have any opinions on how you see that in the next 20 years. Oh, well, who knows? Okay, I'll keep this short and sweet. Um, space exploration has always been a great... Uh, method for ensuring international cooperation. Whether it was a symbol of US uh, Russian, you know, conflict dying down, becoming, you know, no longer Cold War, uh, that was the ISS. Um, more recently, the Mars Perseverance uh, rover, I believe there was a call between the new US administration and France where they thanked each other for their assistance on uh, developing experiments for the rover. So space exploration has always driven international cooperation, and um, let's hope this continues. I, I don't really agree with that, honestly, uh, because it might have, uh, but that was after there was uh, almost a war uh, in space. It was also defense-driven in, in the first decades, uh, I would say, um, because pe people really wanted to be the first uh, to the moon, the first in space, but of course what comes with that is actually... Um, the capability to launch rockets at your opponent from space and to uh, spy at them from space and all of that. So it was really also a lot of military, uh, not directly cooperative um, uh, motivation uh, to, to get this space race started. At least that's the way that I look back at it uh, in history. Um, the history of the space race is pretty funny. Um, I was uh, reading this... Um, basically biography, and it was saying that the people behind the formation of NASA intentionally drummed up the importance of military activity in space, specifically so they could get their rockets funded for actual moon missions. 
So it's, 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 there's a play all around. Everyone's playing with each other. <laughs> yeah, that that uh, that's something I didn't know. Um, but uh, there is an extreme amount of money in uh, the U.S. military budget, and that uh, definitely helps even still uh, fund a lot of uh, space operations. Actually, may I speak? Yeah, of course. Of course, of course. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so what I was going to say is that... Um, how do I say this? Um, I, I did like a paper a few years ago where I uh, basically... Uh, where I basically like attempted to uh, argue the motivations of the... Uh, argue the motivations of uh, uh, space exploration. And uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, while, of course, while uh, the, the motivations of uh, the, uh, the, the people at hand are largely, are largely just for the sake of it, um, it's always justified to uh, the, the, the funders and the people who, uh, well, well, ha- who are actually in charge with them with the money, basically, uh, militarily, uh, or or through some uh, compa- or through some competitive angle. I mean, it's not always justified that way, but it's it's typically. It, that has been a pattern since uh, the uh, since really the 1930s and 1920s, because even the the people behind the the VFR, the the German Rocket Society, uh, they tried to seek uh, they tried to seek funding from the 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 from the Weimar military to uh, develop. Rockets, and I mean, they wanted to eventually launch satellites and people into space, but they were constrained, of course, by the uh, the, uh, the the situation at that time. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 profit motive and the uh, incentives of the state is what I'm saying. Uh, yes, like, well. The motivations have changed over the years. Uh, sometimes, of course, uh, it's for military aims, others for international showmanship, like most of the space race. Mm-hmm. Uh, these days, it's more for commercial reasons. And possibly in the future, we will have direct profit making from space to asteroid mining, delivering water to geostationary satellites so they can stay in orbit for longer. But the important thing is the money has kept flowing for the space industry over the decades. And we can only hope that it continues to increase. Uh, and what we can do with that money also is you know, more and more things. As the, uh, the private sector comes into play, it has its own self-funded R&D loops. Uh, it's no longer dependent entirely on government funding or as they won't build a new rocket, for example. Um, and the cost of launch is also going down, so it doesn't take as much money to send another mission into space. All these are hopefully, let's say, a positive feedback loop, which keeps bringing more and more money into the space industry. The motivations, we don't know what they will be in the future. Maybe there's another war, maybe there's some cultural reason, some some muskites who really want to go to Mars for whatever reason. (laughs) But uh, as long as that continues, we can have more great moments like this Perseverance landing more great discussions like right here yeah, yeah. um right. Ho- hopefully hopefully i mean i'm i'm less convinced because of well i could go on a much longer rant about uh certain political beliefs that i have but um uh yeah and uh what is the other thing that i was going to say i'll get back to it yeah, I think you're you're right in that if you want to get your project funded, you just say it's national security, regardless of what it's about. <laughs> oh. I've, I've been say, I've been saying for a while now that the day that they include climate change as a military threat is the day they get solved. Yes, <laughs> I, I I saw that Biden uh, uh, was trying to get uh, 
the funding that was used for the wall uh, for uh, climate change, which which was, uh, and I and I am uh, all for acknowledging climate change. Let let's be clear, but um, uh, it was interesting to read uh, that actually because it's yeah. FEMA money actually. But uh, that's Very, politics. Sorry about that. Uh, so true. let yeah. So so one one thing um, if, because we have been streaming for four hours or so i don't know i have no idea yeah. um so uh i i'm i'm gonna close off uh, very soon at least um um so i i would like uh grant uh i thought you had a second part to your question so i'll let if if you can still remember it uh, feel free to ask it uh and uh, then i think we should uh, really close off and uh if anyone else who really uh, wants to keep talking about these kinds of things uh, please join us at uh, Nexus Aurora, which is a Discord, uh, a free Discord server you can join. I'll place the link um, uh, in the description of this Zoom meeting. Um, I hope that uh, Felix can also post it uh, beneath uh, the YouTube video as an option. Thank you, uh, Felix. Um, so people can um, uh, can join us there. Uh, this weekend we're going to revamp uh, the whole server and kickstart it again. Um, so it gets more active projects. So you can really work on a lot of cool stuff. Um, we should have been saying this a lot more during the the peaks of the stream, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to, but there was so oh, much going on. It's, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay. But uh, still, uh, feel very free to join us. Uh, because oh yes, uh, also subscribe to. to to Beyond Media. It's the channel we're hosting this right now on YouTube. And we're doing all kinds of stuff, media related to science, to to aging. Um, last time we had Aubrey de Grey on. It was a very interesting discussion and we have a lot of more interesting stuff coming up. So if you've enjoyed this one, maybe you'll enjoy the next one and yeah. Uh, so, Hi. Grant, Grant, uh, do you still have the second part of your question that you would like to ask? Well, I, uh, I mean, I do have uh, uh, questions, but they're they're not really consolidated. So, I, I'm, I think I may have to uh, pass because no I was more, I was more just going to add like a, like a closing remark to it, but it, it may be a, a it, it's straight. He's a bit into the military territory, which, uh, I mean, I guess I could say this because um, uh, I'm a, a big dele believer in uh, uh, the, the I, I doubt the conventional wisdom, basically, that a perfect uh, anti-ICBM defense is impossible. I think that if we are able to do that and basically make it so that any nation on earth just will not, cannot possibly be threatened by any ICBMs, then what will happen is, well, well then the, the, the restrictions on rocket technology sharing will become less severe and we can do more with that if that's possible. Uh, so th that's just what, what I was going to say. It's a bit, uh, I mean, it's a bit military and controversial, but I, I guess. Whatever. No, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, it's free to talk, uh, like this, um, uh, and, uh, to each their own uh, opinion. Um, I see a hand by Farhot uh, Azerbaijani, um, if you like, you can open your mic and uh, have a final word. And after that, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll close off. Uh, and then I'll thank uh, all the people who helped uh, make the stream uh, possible. I mean, thank you all. Yeah, yeah, thank you as well for the questions. Uh, so, uh, Farhot, uh, if you uh, want to ask a question, uh, since you raised your hand, you can open the mic um, and just start talking. If not, uh, okay. I'm gonna yeah. Okay. Okay. okay yeah. Uh, I watched the landing, the simulation that they ran, and the touchdown appeared to be at 12.54 and 42 seconds. And the first image received was at 1.01.42, which is, you know, at 1 p.m., 
at one minute past 1 p.m. at 42 seconds. Now that's that's physically, it. I mean, it's not possible. I mean, that violates the laws of physics for a signal. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure that's adjusted time on Earth for landing signal received, not time nationally on like glo- like Mars global time, as far as I understand. Right, but so you, but even you, the you, even the quality of the image received is is completely not within the framework of the equipment that they're supposed to have. It's no, 320p. It's, it's a 320 got... times 240 pixel image. It's yeah. very, very low. Yeah, quality. 8 kilobits per second. Yeah, that's, that would be Yeah, fine. so that does check out with the, this kind of stream speed they had. Because they, yeah, they, nice. they have a speed of kilobits per second. On, I mean, actually, I don't know if the rovers got actually got better antenna. That's a very good question. I know it was kilobits per second on the cruise stage and aeroshell. Um, I would not be at all surprised if they've got a much better high gain antenna on the rover itself. They can communicate much the, faster. The high gain antenna isn't going to, it's a, that's not going to increase the, the speed at which the signal is trans, transmitted. Um, okay, to- so first of all, regarding the timing question, the the stream you saw animated with all the nice uh, 3D models and everything, it is a simulation which they try to keep somewhat, you know, adjusted with the reality which is going on. But you shouldn't trust the exact numbers on there. It's it's rough. Right. Second, okay. Well, the streams also gave adjusted figures for the times, meaning they are not exact dates, but dates where they show you events as they should have been regardless of the time delay. So there's also some discrepancies over there. I wouldn't look into it into the minute or second. You know. I'm just saying Finally, that from my it's been it's been it's my experience that radio waves travel to speed of light. So. If you do yes, the math, but you... the difference here is when they were reported as being sent and when they were reported being seen. If there is a discrepancy or an adjustment, it would look look as if it was faster than light or something like that. But that's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, but... the whole thing was adjusted for the time delay anyway. I mean, when we were watching that, that had already happened eleven minutes ago. That was already sort of baked in. Um, so yeah, the, the landing so... we saw at uh, wherever it was fifty. Five or whatever was actually happened at 44 okay. 11 minutes previous. We were rece- we, we were only receiving transmission about okay. the success. That makes sense as that happened. So, yeah, that like, makes it sense then. It, so, you're, what, you're saying that the touchdown was actually at 1244? Yeah, exactly. Nice. Because if you, they were receiving the signal transmitted 11 minutes ago at 55 saying it succeeded, touchdown. Okay, that makes sense then. You're off the hook. So, <laughs> that makes sense. Right. No, no conspiracy theory ne- needed. That's great. I know. It's, 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 you know what? It, it's a disease. It's a disease, and I have it. You know, it's just, for whatever no, no, reason. Look, the right reaction is to ask for clarification from multiple sources, and that's what you did. Good job. Yeah. Okay, right. great. Um, Thank I you. have to go now. I've had an excellent time with everyone. This is my first time doing a kind of live stream with like, what was it, a hundred or more people with, and the YouTube on the side. So I also had a great time uh, answering your questions and talking about Phobos, ISRU stations and solar panels on Mars. It's all very exciting stuff. And yeah, uh, thank Henry, you for thank you for and Sam, as well. really knowledgeable people. So yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. You guys have a great way. Have a great day. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, um, uh, guys. Uh, so uh, Henry uh, and Felix and Sam, who uh, came up with the idea, I think, uh, to do this live stream. Uh, thanks uh, so much uh, for uh, for doing this and uh, letting uh, uh, also uh, Malik, who just left, I think, and me uh, be part of uh, the hosting team. It was great to do. Um, let's do it again in the future. And uh, everyone here, uh, feel free to join uh, Nexus Aurora or to take a look at uh, Beyond Media, who you can see uh, the YouTube video of as well uh, in all the links that you found to actually get to this uh, Zoom meeting. Um, I'm going to head off as well and uh, hope to see you on our Discord server of Nexus Aurora, uh, where we talk and design and conceptualize all kinds of uh, things that will make uh, life multiplanetary. So uh, feel free to join us there. Yeah, and thanks. Th- and thank and thank you, Kern, for providing technical support, um, helping with the stream and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did it uh, mostly yourself in the end, but uh, <laughs> thanks uh, for uh, <laughs> for being there.
my, my laptop is running pretty hot by now, so yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, yeah, guys. Thanks, everyone. Have, have, a good thanks have a good night or afternoon or morning or wherever you are. Yeah. T- time zone. Yeah. Have a good time zone. <laughs>